This one. Okay, I didn't know which uh, mic it is. Anyhow, welcome everybody. Um, just one or two announcements, partly because it is a hot day. Um, we'll have a break, brief break, so you can get some water after 45 minutes. So, at quarter to six, and then we will have, I hope, a longer break, half hour break at half past six, and then in the second session. I hope we can do the same. So that's just so that people are hydrated and don't get too hot. Um, may I remind you, and I will do the same, either turn your phones off or put them on silent. Um, I would like people, when they are addressing this chamber, I don't think the acoustics are wonderful with some speakers, so I don't... It's, I, I know it's very flattering if people stand to address the Lord Mayor, but please will you stay seated unless you're Mike uh, or someone with a very loud voice, because all other people, I think it is better for acoustics if people sit and speak into the microphone. As you know, it is being filmed and will be webcast, so please bear that in mind in your behavior. Um, if you leave and intend to come back, please tell the clerk. And I've already mentioned that uh, uh, all being well, we will break at 6.30 for half an hour. Let's try and get as much done before then. And in particular, if we are quick in the first half, we can take questions 15 and uh, agenda items 15 and 16 on notice and bring them before the break so that we then um, are able maybe to finish the whole meeting a little bit sooner. Please. Um, unless it's an isolated technical issue, the agenda is no longer on ModGov, which makes this slightly more difficult than anticipated. Um, the, sorry, did you want to speak? I mean, if you look at the agenda, the items um, 13 and 14, I suppose it does say this section. I mean, are you proposing that we just take the break that bit sooner if we're quick in the no, first half? No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's not there. We can't see it. We can't see it. Um, I can tell you what they are. One is outside organization committee chair reports, agenda page 77. Do you have that? It's not showing. We're, we're, we're going, sorry, we're going, to, we're going to make some inquiries. We weren't aware of that. Is it possible to use one of the other links to access the papers? The, in, the, the, the version on the internet should be working. Okay, can we pause the recording while we sort out what's on ModGov and on the council website? Okay, I'm going to suggest that while... I, d I don't know how many people have been having problems, but while it's resolved, let's proceed. And we have a sober item next. Um, a former Lord Mayor, Alan Armitage, died recently, and at the start of June, and I'm going to ask us, please, to have a minute's silence in his memory. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, now to the main items. Apologies for absence. We have apologies from councillors Diggins, Hayes, Sanderson and Waite. And I also want to note apology from the rector, Anthony Buckley, who cannot attend as well. Thank you very much. Um, any declarations of interest from those councillors? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, and apologies for arriving a couple of minutes late. Um, I'd like to, um, it's, I don't think it's technically a declaration of interest, but make a statement in relation to the item on the agenda about the uh, transfer of funds for the Oxpens Bridge. Because this matter is funded or has been funded in part by the growth deal, uh, the accountable body for the growth deal funding is the Cabinet of the County Council, of which I am a member. Um, and I'm grateful to the monitoring officer for some very detailed advice about that, which I interpret to say that I should withdraw for that item. So that's what I will do. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? I too, as Andrew, and have been privy of some discussions as well. We do have other county councillors present, so I, I don't know if they want to make a similar statement. Okay, thank you very much. So, with that, let's proceed. I, I find that advice slightly odd because um, the, uh, uh, I mean, yes, technically speaking, the county council is the accountable body, but the spending of the growth, uh, growth board funding is the growth board, the future Oxfordshire partnership. That's where the decisions should be being made, not by the county council cabinet. Uh, they are supposed to pass on the decisions um, of the future Oxfordshire partnership, which is the leaders of the councils across Oxfordshire. So I'm <laughs> casting some doubt on that advice. Sorry. Um, sorry to be getting into a tit for tat before the meetings even started, Lord Mayor, but having attended uh, meetings of the Future Oxygen Partnership and uh, its predecessor, the Growth Board, for many years, um, I can't count the number of times I've been told that the Growth Board and Future Oxygen Partnership is not a decision-making body, and its decisions sit with the sovereign councils whose representatives sit on it. Um, I, I mean, I can read out the lengthy advice that I've been given. Um, it did leave it to me to make that determination, and that's what I've done. On the tit for tat, <laughs> sorry. I mean, you're right, Andrew, that's right. It is, it's not a sovereign body. But equally, the county council isn't the sovereign body either. It is all of the councils in Oxfordshire together who are the sovereign bodies on all funding for the growth deal. So that's all I'm saying. I think, unless we want to take further legal guidance, I'm going to suggest we note the difference of opinion on this. I doubt it will affect uh, the outcome of our deliberations. So I'm going to suggest that we've noted it and we'll proceed to the next item, which is to consider the minutes from the last two meetings, one of which was the annual meeting, which are agenda pages 23 and 31. Does anyone have any uh, corrections or comments to make on uh, the 21st of March meeting? Please. Uh, Lord Mayor, it's not about that. I've just found out another apology. Can I please declare an apology from one of our councillors? Please. Councillor Tidball. Thank you. It will be noted. Um, Okay, I, I take it there are no corrections on the 21st of March minutes on the annual meeting on the 18th of May? No, thank you. So I uh, assume, therefore, we approve the minutes as a correct record. Thank you very much. Agenda item four is the appointment to committees. Um, they are in the papers... Uh, I could tell you what they are. There are not many of them. 
if you don't have it up on your screen, for Standards Committee, Councillor Diggins is being replaced by Councillor Raymond. On Licensing and Gambling Acts Committee, Councillor Thomas is being replaced by Councillor Dunn. And on the Scrutiny Committee, Councillor Ros Smith is being replaced by Councillor Altaf Khan. I hope we can note that. Thank you very much. So we now proceed to the announcements. My Lord Mayor announcements, other than to note, of course, I've begun my Lord Mayor's uh, year. I just wanted really to comment on two things in particular. One is that we had a very successful exchange with the Bonn uh, city, and they were very well represented in Oxford. And I will encourage as many councillors as possible to go to Bonn. The dates are the 24th to the 28th of August. I know we will be treated tremendously well, and so it would be good if we are as well represented as they were when they came here. Um, the other thing is, we are now in the city celebrating the 400th anniversary of the Botanic Gardens. They have laid on all sorts of events, um, and I would encourage you as uh, members of the council and others to come and visit it, because they're really putting on a very good show. And that was all that I really wanted to mention. Um, are there any announcements for the sheriff? Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Yes. Um, uh, four things briefly, if I may. Um, first of all, I must mention that I had the great pleasure of being uh, asked to be Master of Ceremonies for um, the celebration of Sue Holden's 50 years volunteering within the Barton and Sandhills community. Any of you who know Sue Holden will know that she is the Tower of, uh, a Tower of Strength. Um, and um, I... I, I was, a, I was a, a little taken aback to get a massive cheer when I said Sue Holden is the real councillor for Barton, but, um, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm just glad she's not interested in elections. Um, uh, able to attend a number of twinning events, including, uh, including the uh, last week, the sponsored swim for our twin city of Leon in Nicaragua, in Hinksy Lido, which, uh, by a strange coincidence, is exactly where I want to be at this moment. Um, the, uh, there was the... Uh, we did the annual um, Aunt Sher Sheriff versus um, Freeman Aunt Sally match, which we lost gloriously. Um, many thanks to Ed and Susan for taking part and being rather more successful than I was, although that's not saying much. Um, lastly, and on a slightly more serious note, um, uh, last month was the annual inspection of Port Meadow, and uh, we've... Although we saw a lot of wildlife, it was mainly of the uh, two-legged kind. And on the weekend following uh, the inspection, uh, Oxford Direct Services collected two and a half tonnes of rubbish from the meadow. Um, this, is, uh, this is the year after the uh, rubbish killed a couple of horses who unfortunately tend to eat it. Um, cattle uh, step on uh, sharp rubbish and, and injure themselves. Plus, the, uh, the meadow is uh, a site of special scientific interest. It's uh, a unique landscape. In fact, there are a couple of species of, um, uh, of water-loving plants that uh, at one point only, ex uh, only existed were extinct in England other than on Port Meadow it's a, couple of, uh, a couple of decades ago. They've now um, been reintroduced in a few other places. Um, so it's a very valuable landscape, and this is, uh, is record-breaking temperatures, but unfortunately people are still taking bonfires, uh, portable bonfires, and lighting them on Port Meadow. So uh, I guess the message that, I, that also I put out on social media, we don't want to be like bloody Christchurch College and restrict the use of our land for celebrations, but if we might have to if, if behaviour of this 
of that kind goes on because it is for, it is for everybody to enjoy. So sorry to end on that uh, slightly more sombre note, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Deputy Lord Mayor, any announcement? Uh, just briefly, just again, some of the twinning events and the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Armed Forces briefing was thoroughly enjoyed. We also had the lovely chair of Oxfordshire County Council there as well. That's it for me. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned, the city rector can't be with us today. Sent his apologies. Um, leader, do you have, leader of the council, do you have any um, announcements or... Com uh, other comments by cabinet members? Uh, yes, just, just to say I had hoped at this council to be able to announce uh, champions and my apologies, um, partly due to the fact that there was absolutely no mobile reception at all in the area of Yorkshire I was in over the weekend. I haven't managed to complete my phone calls and discussions with people, but um, I will be announcing champions uh, over the next kind of week or so. Um, so that will be... Uh, uh, announced soon but sorry i've not been able to do that today thank you chief executive nothing finance officer no monitoring officers no um item six public addresses and questions on matters for decision i see there are none so we're already on agenda item seven and we're gradually coming. I, I should ask, have the people who couldn't see the papers, have they been able to see the confidential appendices yet? It's back. Ah, thank you very much. So we come, first of all, to the affordable housing delivery programme. I believe you are going to propose this. Is that correct? Uh, yes, this is a complex uh, uh, series of uh, recommendations incorporating numerous um, different schemes at different stages. Um, uh, I so move and look forward to um, uh, the fulsome support of the whole council. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Thank you. Councillor Linda Smith is seconding. Um, do we have any questions? Thank you, Lodmer. Uh, this is all uh, very, uh, uh, very welcome things to see in the report. Uh, uh, good to see you. Uh, uh, a lot of progress being made. Uh, there's, of course, uh, one thing that sticks out uh, by contrast, and that's the uh, report sets out a series of uh, renovations and extensions and the uh, 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 cost overruns that have occurred with regards to them, or at least cost deviations with respect to what was originally projected. Uh, I wonder if we could have any assurance as to what has been changed in the interim uh, to ensure that uh, going forwards projects like these either won't be undertaken or be undertaken differently uh, so as to produce uh, better results in that respect in future. Would one of you, would you respond? Yeah, I think the, the, the short answer on this is that um, quite a lot of these are projects inherited from the housing revenue account uh, by the housing company. Um, they are small, fiddly, tricky, difficult projects with minimal um, scope for things to go wrong. And so when things do go wrong, the, there isn't any opportunity to go get them back. Um, it is my view, and it's the view of the company going forward, that it would have no... Uh, interest in working on projects like these. Um, there are, of course, sites within the HRA which might be suitable for this. Um, uh, the fact they've taken this long to come forward is probably indicative uh, of, of a, a, an accurate assessment of the degree of risk uh, involved in the potential pitfalls. Uh, and I think that um, I would want to see them, if they were coming forward at all, coming forward with um, innovative solutions um, around prefabrication which, uh, on, and things like that, which uh, off-site manufacture, I think, is uh, or modern methods of construction, as it's now termed, um, off-site manufacture in particular. Uh, and those are the sorts of solutions which I think are uh, appropriate here. But um, they're not really ones that the housing company's uh, business plan ever envisaged it doing. It was uh, just, just uh, that uh, it inherited those as ones which have been instigated within the HRA. Sorry, any other questions? If not, may we proceed to a vote? Those in favour, please. 
against. So uh, it is carried. Thank you very much. It, um, agenda item eight is the proposal for public realm improvements on council-owned land in the city centre, which does have confidential appendix. Um, I believe that Councillor Turner is going to propose this. I need a seconder, by the way. Maybe I can ask for a seconder now, Councillor Brown. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much, Lord Mayor. As you correctly note, there's a chunky confidential appendix on this. Um, but suffice to say, as a council, we, of course, um, cherish our, our city centre. We want it to be a pleasant uh, place for people to spend time. And uh, this area is, is very much at the heart of it. Um, and we're always on the lookout for opportunities to uh, invest to make it an even nicer place to spend time. Um, and I uh, think can warmly commend, I think, the uh, opportunities outlined here uh, in this report to Council, um, and uh, it will certainly fulfil that purpose. So I would like to move the recommendation. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Please, Councillor Smoten. Thank you again. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so the proposed works uh, for Gloucester Green are uh, welcome in principle, uh, but they're so clearly... So could I just check that you're not going to stray into confidential items? Yes, I'm not going to stray into confidential items. Okay, uh, so the changes are welcome in principle, but they're also clearly optional. Uh, the market is currently thriving, uh, and on balance, this seems likely to do good, um, but, uh, but as I say, it's, it's not a thing that is vital for its well-being. Would you like? We're absolutely in confidential areas what? now, so I think we, 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 if we're going to have this discussion, we need to have it in confidential session. Um, I mean, all I've said is some sort of changes. <laughs> That's it. I mean, I, I'm going to suggest that rather than stray into this, um, if it's possible for this to be taken privately, separately, with uh, the leader or the deputy leader, I mean, the key... Right. Can we move then to part two? Here's the extremely, extremely brief and extremely vague version then. This is some optional spending. We're about to go into a budget review cycle that has noted that it has a very large gap to cover. Therefore, optional projects seem like they are going to be the best candidates to pause. Therefore, I think we should ask for this to be paused and brought back at a more opportune time. Could you? Um, yeah, thanks, Lord Mayor. I can only assure the Council that all of the relevant issues have been considered in the round, um, and of course, at this time as well, we do need to be mindful of the uh, need for pleasant places uh, in our city centre uh, and the potential that these public realm improvements would provide. We also uh, need to uh, we also need to be mindful of the potential uh, benefits uh, to uh, city city centre traders, who of course have had a hard time of uh, having uh, an attract attractive spaces in the city centre. Uh, and I can only assure the council, bearing in mind information here and information in the con confidential appendix, that that, uh, that uh, analysis has been fully weighed up, uh, and that is why we are bringing forward the recommendation as we are. And I think you know there's probably more that could be said in confidential session, but I'll leave it there. Councillor Rose Smith. Thank you. I'll be very careful how I ask my question then too. Um, yes, I think improvements to our city welcomed but again I, I would concur with my council friend there that we might actually think about pausing given we have had headlines of cuts possible cuts coming on squeeze on our budget coming budgets and I would just ask if I could through you uh, Lord Mayor um, what's um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find out really what sort of uh, future budgets we're going to need to look at with regards to revenue to make upkeep of any changes that are made to the public realm. Um, will that be a budget thing for a future budget uh, proposal for the revenue upkeep of these changes? Please, Councillor Turner. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I think I think um, it's important in developing the scheme that we will need to be mindful that uh, revenue costs uh, should should be kept to a minimum. I don't imagine this will actually uh, prove anything particularly expensive. It will uh, uh, should deliver a nice in environment for a good price. Um, but the point is is well taken, uh, and of course uh, there'll be the opportunity to look at some detail uh, down the track. So happy to take on board those points, uh, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. I don't see any more questions. May we proceed to a vote, please? Those in favour? Those against? I, it has a majority, so thank you very much. This is uh, approved. And then we proceed to agenda item nine, which is additional loan finance for the Oxwed LLP. I believe that's going to be proposed by Councillor Hollingsworth, is that correct? Or is it Councillor Turner? You're both down on my list. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to propose it. Um, it's part of uh, um, the ongoing relationship um, that this council has uh, with, with Oxford. Um, and again, if you look at the confidential um, agenda, you will see that the funds are uh, in large part to pay for uh, uh, acquisition of further land which the project was always intended to acquire. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Ross Smith. Thank you, and thank you for that explanation. So, if, from what you just said, we were always, this council was always going to acquire this land at some point. So, why have we had to increase the budget now, uh, capital spend, £600,000 on this? if it was always intentionally to have that land in the first place to do the scheme that you're suggesting. I'm sorry, I didn't ask for a seconder, but I've got down here Councillor Turner a seconder. I hope that's correct, sorry. Um, could you answer? I, I think the, the niceties of the way that the budget is arranged on this is probably more for Ed, so I'll let him answer that bit. Yeah, thanks very much. Unfortunately, in, in talking at a Council of Three, I think it would be necessary for me to refer to the confidential ap appendix. Uh, if we want to hold off uh, going into confidential session, I think it might be most useful for the uh, councillors to look at the pages 105, uh, 106, uh, in particular of the agenda that set, set it out. I mean, fund fundamentally, um, and without straying into the details, um, what I think we and our partners in Nuffield College need to do is bring forward a scheme uh, in Oxpens which uh, makes the most of the space, which is really attractive, which is fantastic, which is compliant uh, with our planning policies. Um, and I have to say, and I'll be really honest with Council about this, uh, also sees a financial return being provided to our Council sooner rather than later, and I hope into the long term rather than just leaving it, rather, rather than just a one-off slug of money. Um, in order for that to happen, we need to fund uh, jointly with Nuffield College um, the partnership to uh, bring forward uh, all of the, the planning application, all, the relevant, all of the other relevant work that needs to happen, processes of negotiation with others in the area, all that sort of thing. Um, and uh, what rather than uh, allowing great big contingencies on that initial plan, um, instead uh, we're, we're keeping it quite tight, tight and when we need to release extra funds, that's what we propose to do. And I think that's the right, right way of doing it. So if you like, uh, Lord Mayor, we're keeping Oxford on a fairly tight leash. Um, uh, the alternative to spending this money uh, it seems to me, would be uh, not to progress uh, the scheme or to look at, uh, in some ways, changing the nature of our partnership approach. And I can't imagine those would be in the long-term interests uh, of our city or, indeed, of our city council's finances. I hope I've strayed the right side of the line in terms of the uh, appendices there. Thank you very much. Councillor Smerton. I think we should uh, oppose what's in front of us today, essentially on the grounds uh, that it's good money after bad. Uh, I think Councillor Turner has it exactly right uh, when he says to either not proceed uh, or to seek a fundamental reworking. We've seen the central contradiction here in the economic strategy that went through Council recently. 
two pillars pulling against each other, the sort of drive for inclusivity taking the form of providing housing, uh, but then also the drive for global significance taking the form of commercial development, uh, increase of demand, pulling away at those new housing units, increasing the demand and increasing the cost of living uh, in Oxford. That's fundamentally what we've got in front of us in the shape of Oxford, and here we just have a little bit more money towards the same cause. On grounds that it's the biggest and most significant site that we have the power to contribute that's within the city, that seems to me like the one place where our city has the power to contribute positively to the balance of housing in our city. Uh, and for that reason, I think Oxford itself, uh, and by extension, uh, the request that's before us today, uh, should be opposed. Councillor Hollingsworth and then I'm, Councillor I'm Malik. Assume, was that a question, Lord Mayor? I'm trying to work out, is that a question? I'm happy to I answer it as if it were. Yes, I, I'm happy to answer. Do you not agree or whatever? The, yeah, something like that. Um, no, I do not agree um, is the short answer to the question I've just posed. Um, I think the first kind of fundamental point, this is um, releasing funds to acquire a piece of land we currently do not own. So, so uh, it's not like we'd still have the land in question. We'd, we wouldn't have acquired it. The company wouldn't have acquired it. Um, I think in terms of the comment, and this is an interesting reversion of, re reversal of previous uh, political positions, certainly I, and I'm sure even more so, Councillor Turner, will be looking forward robustly uh, to the Liberal Democrat alternative budget proposals without Oxford's uh, funding over a period of 30 years in it to the tune of tens of millions of pounds, which is indeed what it is. So uh, I'm, I'm sure those, those, those plans will be worked out in the fullness of time. And frankly, if you don't turn up at the end of January, beginning of February with them, I shall be deeply, deeply disappointed because I'm sure it will show a huge amount of innovation uh, and an opportunity for all, us, all of us to debate an alternative financial vision for the local authority. I'm now going to take Councillor Malik, please. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Uh, well, there are some things you need to pause on and think about. I think I agree with the Councillor Turner. So as a councillor, you have a responsibility of the citizen of Oxford. And if you hold on to this scheme, I think this scheme will benefit the residents of Oxford and taxpayer longer term. That's comment, I take it, rather than a question. Uh, Mike, were you also going to make a comment or question, please? Um, th thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, it was really more, more of a comment, having, uh, have, having, having worked on this in my, my previous role, I, and with, with great respect to Councillor Smoton, I, don't, I fail to see what's wrong with providing a mixture of employment and housing, including significant affordable housing, uh, in the city centre, right next to uh, all of the pub, all, all, just about all of the public transport uh, <laughs> in the city, if not Oxfordshire, rather than prov uh, providing that in places where people would have to drive to. I think that helps uh, meet the council's environmental as well as. Uh, local plan objectives and the council's uh, budget bottom line. Thank you. I assume that doesn't need an answer. Are you going to be making a different point, uh, or is this just going backwards and forwards? I was going to take uh, Councillor Hollingsworth up on something he said, if that's all right. Um, it's an interesting response uh, about the uh, budgetary consideration. Um, purely because I don't think that's the justification for the project that we've heard in the past. Uh, it's always previously been described uh, as itself a good, whereas it sounds from what you're saying as if, as if it, this is fundamentally providing you with funding with which to do other things. I mean, if, if that's the drive here, then that's, that's interesting to hear, and I think it would be great for that to be, to be said out loud. Uh, to Councillor Rowley's point, um, I... So what is your question? We're, we're getting into a debate rather than question. To Councillor Rowley's point, I would just say uh, that it's not that it's bad to have a mix, it's the specific mix that's being questioned. Uh, and I guess if you'd like a question, it would be, would you not both agree? Well, I don't I mean, know who... Uh, which of you two I, is going I'll to respond? Councillor Turner, I believe... Far from keeping it quiet, Councillor Turner said it out loud about three minutes ago. But anyway, that's Thank you. I was going to take Councillor Randall Mills. You had your hand up. Do you have another 
question. Just briefly, um, will Nuffield College be matching the £600,000 contribution? And will that be an equal share of the um, land? Would you like to uh, clarify? Yeah, well, in answer to the first one, yes, they're a 50% shareholder and they don't, we don't take a share of the land. The land is held by the company in which we're both 50% shareholders. Fair enough. In that case, I think we've uh, exhausted the questions and comments. So can we now proceed to a vote, please? Sorry. Susan. Yeah, well, I, I'm sorry. I've, I, this is a comment. Um, I'm just slightly astounded by the complete uh, change of heart um, from, from, the, from the opposition uh, on this particular project. It's, it's not ever been a secret. Uh, in fact, it's been a, a matter of some considerable discussion uh, that this project is both about redeveloping a part of the city which is in sore need of it and is currently um, uh, not a good there's not a good use of the land there um, it's about creating a space which we can really be proud of as a city um, regenerating it um, and making sure that we are providing homes and jobs in a really sustainable location as has already been said but we've also always been very explicit that it is about making sure that we make returns for the council so we can invest them in services for the people of Oxford. Uh, and that's absolutely been part of our financial plans for many years. And as, uh, as has already been said, I think anyone opposing this needs to think very carefully about how they would then fund those plans uh, instead. So, Councillor Turner, did you want to second, I guess, to, to make a concluding comment? Hint well taken, Lord Mayor. I mean, just, just it, without, without duplicating what uh, Alex and Susan and others have said, we're thinking back on the history of this. We had um, disparate parcels of land, one, you know, the largest of which was owned by London and Continental Railways, and it was a heroic shift put in by officers uh, and, and councillors at the time to try to make sure that rather than the government simply sticking a for sale sign on it and then doing whatever would bring the greatest return, uh, instead we could establish a partnership with Nuffield um, in order to bring forward a really high quality, attractive development. And those were the terms on which we set up um, the existing partnership. Um, and uh, that also relies, uh, I say relies, it will be beneficial um, if there can be some land acquisition as well. We, of course, set out the planning framework in the local plan that the council's already agreed. We've got uh, this supplementary planning document um, going through uh, as well, uh, which is probably the place to have the planning debate rather than on the funding. Um, the alternative, I suppose, uh, and we could get into the legal uh, weeds of this, would be to say to our partner, sorry, our values are no longer alive, uh, aligned, we want out. Um, we would then, um, I suppose, uh, be in a position uh, to sell uh, some, of, some of our share. That would be damaging in the long term, and it would also mean that we had much less the ability to influence the form and the quality of the development. This is precisely about us shaping it in a way which is beneficial. So uh, I would say as well, be a bit careful what we wish for. This would be doing the wrong thing by the city, and it would be doing the wrong thing by the City Council's finances. So I'm going to suggest we proceed to the vote. So those in favour? Those against? It is carried, so thank you very much. I'm going to suggest that although it's just about quarter two when I said we'd have a break to get a drink, um, I'm going to suggest we proceed quickly to agenda item 10 and ask uh, Susanna to introduce it. Mm -hmm. You I can move, sit down. Um, I move the report. <laughs> Any questions for Susanna? Seconder yeah, it's is... A, it's a formal... Uh, Thank you very much. I don't think anybody needs a Yorkshire adding further hot air to this. Okay. Any questions? Can we proceed to a vote? Those in favour of Peter Noland joining the Standards Committee, non-voting member? Those against? That is approved. Thank you very much. I'm going to suggest, before we proceed to agenda item 11, the Cabinet Minutes, we, people who want to drink proceed very quickly, get one outside. There's cold water there, and then we resume. Thank you. 13th of April, 15th of June, and the draft for the 13th of July. Um, rather than maybe go painstakingly through them one after the other, um, do 
people, do members have any questions about the minutes? Please, Councillor Gant. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. This is a question about um, an item on the second set of Cabinet minutes before us, item 11B, to do with the City Centre Action Plan. Uh, we've been waiting a while for this for perfectly good reasons, um, but it, it's a real missed opportunity. It's a very disappointing document. It's, it's thin. It's a list largely of things that are already being done by other people. Um, it contains, for example, on tourism, quite a lot of things that were in the uh, scrutiny review uh, report, which I had the honour of chairing and which indeed you, Lord Mayor, uh, uh, served on. Um, for example, it, it commits to explore options for a new model of the Visitor Information Centre. Well, the question is, why did you pull the plug on the old model? And my question is, will you restore the old model by restoring the grant? Uh, you will say that you will support the County Council's short and long-term options for where tourist coaches can drop off and target the accreditation of a coach-friendly city. Well, the response to the recommendations of that report on 28th of my, May 2019 said that the leader recognised the importance of managing coaches effectively, but was doubtful about the merits of seeking coach-friendly status, which appeared to be skewed too much in favour of operators' needs. Um, was the leader right then or right now, or is this just the usual practice of rubbishing a good idea when it's somebody else's and then waiting to claim it as your own? Um, above all, if this is a strategy, why is there no budget? Why are there no KPIs? Why are there no timescales, apart from ones which already exist in other people's plans? So could I just ask, is it... I'm not sure which person will respond to that. Imogen, would you like to respond, please? Well, um, I'm sure you share my love of reading if you think it's a thin document, because it's rather hefty. Um, it's... It is so because it's going over. Um, I suppose it will inspire a lot more reading for you. Um, so I, I hope you look forward to that. Um, we have so many different proposals outlined for different parts of the city, and this is trying to make sense of them, to highlight work already being done, as you say. Um, and I think that's important. We need to understand what's going on. Uh, we have a very changing economic landscape in the city centre, and we need to be, have, have a cohesive vision for it to be able to predict what's coming to be able to adapt, to adapt accordingly. Um, so I think it's a misunderstanding of what this document's setting out to achieve to, to pick it up on the grounds that you have. Um, and I think you'll, you'll see a lot more proposals coming out of this vision that is, is an, an overview. And, it's, and it, it, I'm very happy to be part of a lot of the um, task force meetings, the focus groups that are starting up, and officers have put a huge amount of work into really engaging with stakeholders and taking from this more general document some real, um, that sets out our general, absolutely general priorities and ideas, some detailed plans, and to, I think that's the point at which we need to be engaging and, um, and really getting to the detail of things. Um, on visitor information centres, um, this, this is very much, I completely agree with officer recommendations, and if you look up and down the country, we're seeing these closing. So I, I really don't think it's worth clinging on to something that unfortunately is not going to be a, an important part of our city centre going forwards. And we need to be ready to adapt, and things are changing, and we need to have documents such as the action plan that focus on that and look to the future. Thank you. Um, Councillor Farwether. Thank you. Um, I studied this with some detail. I've lived in Oxford for many, many years, and the city centre is, quite frankly, a shambles. This isn't an action plan or even a longer-term strategy. It's more of a wish list. There are no firm dates, no budgetary figures, no mention of fundraising. Car parking has already been dealt with by the county in Broad Street. There's no vision of, of what Broad Street could become. Where, where's the involvement of other stakeholders, like the Oxford Preservation Trust? Why aren't the, some of the wealthiest colleges in Oxford who border Broad Street involved? What is the experimental scheme for, for 2022? Are we going to see the return of the plastic grass and wooden box planters, or have they already been scrapped? Um, I think the councillor opposite asks a lot of questions that are actually answered if you look in the action plan. 
Um, he talks about timelines, which I find absolutely bizarre, because not only are there timelines, but they're, they're actually very engaging and easy to understand ones. Um, they're, they're, I, I was very impressed with them, because you can visually see when things are going to start. They're at the bottom of each plan. Are, are you missing some appendices, perhaps? Um, uh, Broad Street, which you mentioned, has dedicated pages. So does Corn Market, so, do, so does Bond Square, so does Market Street, so do umpteen areas in the city centre. And I don't share your, your feelings on the city centre either. I work on Broad Streets. I, I've lived in the city centre in Gloucester Green in the past. I'm, I spend most of my lunch breaks in the covered markets or the surrounds, and I think it's a beautiful part of the city. I think that, that where the city council has influence, we've done a really good job to, to shape it, to, to adapt to a really difficult uh, landscape in terms of um, the pandemic and the, the problems that's posed. Um, to uh, with meanwhile uses and we're really taking a, a, look, a hard look at our covered market now which is really exciting to see um, so I, I'm sorry but I can't share some of those concerns and I do think those questions could have been posed earlier firstly but secondly are answered by the document he refers to Councillor Turner then Councillor Malik um, uh, thanks so much um, uh, perhaps this is overly charitable but I genuinely think what uh, Imogen said is quite right in that um, you need to read uh, the action plan alongside the appendix. You need the 134-page document, not the 25-page one. Um, and there you'll find granularity, detail, and timelines. I have to say, I've read some pretty naff council reports uh, in my time, and I think, and I've read some really good ones. I think this is a really good one where a lot of thoughts gone into it. It's also presented um, in, in a clear way, um, and uh, and it has real vision. We, we sometimes, as a council, and we'll come on to this a little bit in, in questions, will be. Um, uh, there'll be an assumption that we, for example, own everything, or that, for example, that we govern uh, everything's use, and clearly that, that isn't so. Um, but this, I think, shows the absolute right blend of uh, leadership. Um, uh, clearly, there's more we can do when we own an asset, uh, but, also, but also trying to make sure the city centre works for everyone. Uh, and in terms of budget, um, again, have a, have a, it's worth having a good look uh, at the full council budgets. Uh, and there you'll see, for example, our economic development function. You'll see spend, significant spend, actually, uh, over the coming period, for example, uh, in, in the covered market. Um, there isn't a single budget line saying city centre action plan because it's uh, at the core of so many different projects um, that we have. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled, and I can only commend the full documents, uh, including the appendix and also thank Imogen for all of her hard work in recent times on this. Councillor Malik. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. I want to ask a question on the local electric vehicle infrastructure. Uh, basically, uh, it's nice to see uh, this progressing, but in East Oxford, we have a very good and very uh, popular charging point at East uh, by Manzal Way which is always busy and sometimes there are more cars are waiting. So my question is, going further ahead towards Kavli, is the council has any plan to install any electric uh, charges, especially like Marsh Park and further ahead into Kavli area, because we need to provide slightly citywide if we want people to use the electric cars. Councillor Upton, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, Councillor Malik, yes, if you look at the electric vehicle charging strategy that was just passed at Cabinet uh, last week, you will see what, what the plans are. So installing electric vehicle infrastructure is extremely expensive, so we need to do it in conjunction with, with private partners. And so we're looking at a way of doing it fairly across the city so that we will have to parcel up areas where it might be less commercially viable with areas where it is very commercially viable in order to make uh, private companies put it in, you know, sort of equitably across the city. But of course that will include your parts of the city. Okay. Councillor Fowether, you've got your uh, microphone on, are you? No? Are there any other... Questions about, yes, please, Chris Jarvis. 
Sorry, it's been a while. Um, hopefully a straightforward question. Just on, It's on the, the cabinet minutes of the 15th of June in relation to the Oxford Economic Strategy. Um, firstly, just um, welcome to see that the, uh, a lot of the recommendations uh, from Scrutiny Committee, which I think were really important, have been accepted um, as part of that. But given the, um, the scale and scope and the level of public interest in the economic strategy, um, I wanted to ask um, whether um, there was a mood to bring that economic strategy to full council for um, approval um, as part of the process of adopting it, given its um, importance to the city. I mean, Please. This, this, it is. This is it. It, it is here as part of the cabinet minutes. So that's not for approval. Well, no, because it's not. It's not a delegated issue to to council. Um, it's uh, it, it's cabinet's responsibility. So no, I don't intend to bring it as a separate document to council. Um, it's here, uh, it, you know, as part of the cabinet minutes. We have two or three minutes left in this item. Does anyone have any further questions about the minutes? Otherwise, I'm going to suggest that we can proceed then on to agenda item 12, which is all the questions on notice uh, from members of the council. I have one correction. Um, uh, there was an omission in the printed version I think it may be correct on ModGov, I'm not quite sure. But if you have a printed version in front of you, this is um, question SA2 from Councillor Jarvis to Councillor Aziz about standing for house development. And I was asked just to read out the corrected uh, final comment. Will the portfolio agree? Holder agreed to a meeting with the groups based at the community centre and East Oxford councillors to look at potential solutions to the problems facing the groups during the redevelopment. I'm advised that the cabinet member has seen the full question and has responded to it. It is just omitted, sadly, from the printed version, at least, that some of us have but that was just one minor correction but maybe we can proceed now to the questions so the first one sb1 is from councillor miles to councillor brown mm -hmm. on portraits do you have any supplementary i do thank you um, can the leader confirm mm -hmm. that the preferred option and the intention is to have additional portraits representing the diversity of our city placed within the council chamber itself. I know that this has been discussed as a potential option, so, um, and, uh, and of course it's subject to necessary requirements due to the list of building status of the town hall. So can you confirm that that is the prefer a preferred option, please? Thank you. I can confirm that that was, that was certainly part of our discussions, and thank you very much for your contributions, Catherine, um, uh, to, to those discussions. Um, that was one of the things we were looking at, but I think, disappointingly, unfortunately, have been unable to get engagement from uh, those colleges we were hoping to learn from who had been through the process themselves um, uh, about, um, you know, details of how they went about it. Um, but I think we, we are hoping to make some progress soon. Next question from the same councillor to the same councillor about the Woodstock Road corridor improvements. Any supplement? Thank you. Um, from Councillor Miles to Councillor Brown, homes for, from infrastructure programme schemes. Any supplementary? No, thank you very much. Uh, then from Councillor Smoton to Councillor Brown about the job ratio. Any supplementary? Uh, yes, uh, you said in your answer you thought there'd be some profound uh, negatives to a lower job ratio in Oxford. Supposing for a moment that we are sort of 20 years on uh, and that, yes, the commercial industrial sectors of Oxford have grown, but that housing has outstripped that growth, has grown faster, and, and that ratio has come down as a result. What do you see as the, the, really, the most important negatives of that? Sorry, I'm trying to imagine this kind of mythical world in which uh, we've got loads and loads of housing, <laughs> which uh, seems, uh, seems unlikely. Um, I think that the main uh, issue that I'm concerned about is um, the idea of having people uh, travelling to, uh, to jobs on 
obscure business estates in the middle of nowhere, which is the alternative, effectively, business parks um, uh, across the county. We've tried that model. Um, and what happens? You have, it, with that model of employment, what you see is everyone has to get there by car. Um, with very, very few exceptions, all of those business parks are entirely reliant on the private motor car. Jobs in the city mean that people can walk there, they can cycle there, they can get there by public transport, they can get there through park and ride. Uh, there are all sorts of different ways in which people can commute into cities. Cities are natural places of employment. Cities are places across the country where you will see high levels of employment. Um, Oxfordshire is no different to that. And in fact, because we are a particularly rural county, we have relatively high levels of employment in the city compared to the rest of the county. That is not surprising, it is more sustainable. So um, I think that it, it, it is entirely sensible to um, want to make sure that there are jobs in the city that people can travel to. We also want to make sure that there are houses for people, and that means that we will have to um, do what we are doing already, which is cooperating with our neighbouring authorities to make sure that, there is, uh, th that suitable housing is being built uh, as an extension to the city to increase the chances of people being able to get to work in the city. So can we uh, try and keep the answers walking. within two minutes, please? <laughs> by walking, by uh, cycling, and through public transport. And I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then we move on to Councillor Malik. A question for Councillor Turner on cuts to Oxford City Council services. You have an answer there. Do you have any supplementary? Thank you very much. The next one is from Councillor Malik, Councillor Turner, the number of empty council-owned units. Supplementary? No, thank you very much. And then from you to Councillor Turner, St Aldate's Chambers rental, any supplementary? Yeah, thanks for the answer, uh, Councillor Turner. Well, it's all right for us to balance the books and everything. I think we are a council also have a responsibility to our taxpayer to provide them the service. So many, I don't know the other council, but many of my constituents have complained closure of the St. Aldates. But my question is this, saving all that money, what benefit the citizen of Oxford will have? Would you in future proposing frozen any council tax, what relief they can have? Councillor Turner. <laughs> uh, okay, I mean, so a couple of points. Um, I mean, one is this is about the office, the office space as well as the customer services. And clearly, we need. To, you know, we've also got a duty for as an employer to make sure people have the right places to work. I think we've all discovered home working can work more than it did a few years ago, and it would be uh, daft not to try and you know get the opportunities um, better for the environment, better for our balance sheet um, if we're not spending money on offices that we don't need. At the same time, we clearly need to have the right spaces for people to work. And I think we'll be able to do more. For example, uh, in in our town hall building. Um, if we, you know, in, the in the future. Um, in terms of customer services, um, co-location uh, with the county library um, seems like a, a good idea uh, to me. Again, it, it, it uh, uses space more efficiently, and I don't think it's uh, any particular disbenefit to people. Um, I think, and a previous question Saj asked uh, was about cuts to our budget, and maybe I can refer to that. You know, the situation we are in because of the double-digit inflation, because of the impact of COVID, uh, and of course because of the impact of austerity, is we are consistently expected to get by with far, far less money. And so I think we have to be honest, some of this is about mitigating the impact of cuts that we don't want to make, but if the government sits on its hands, we might be forced to make. And, I, and clearly, I don't know where that sort of decision would fall. I don't want it to happen. That's why we're being extremely energetic, lobbying government. It's why we're making as much noise as we can with the local government association, all the rest of it. Local government is not being treated fairly, but I think the problem is we are being expected at a time where our costs are going through the roof can, because of double-digit inflation. Within two minutes. Absolutely. Um, our costs are going through the roof. We're not being adequately compensated by government. It's not fair, and so we do have to look to save money on the back office. Thank you very much. Um, we then come to a question from one of our new councillors. Welcome, Councillor Rawl. Is that how you pronounce your name? Rawl. Yes, thank you. Anyhow, you have one on fair tax declaration pledges to Councillor Turner. Do you have a supplementary? I don't, thank you. Don't. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a model. Um, 
Councillor Smoten to Councillor Turner on council advice services cuts the supplement. Uh, I, I note your uh, deferral uh, to council as the uh, obviously the body of ultimate responsibility in the field. So to rephrase a little, uh, will you be using your influence as the portfolio holder to ensure that the cuts to advice centres uh, that were proposed in the previous round of budgeting are not once again proposed in, in this round of budgeting? Councillor Turner. I'll use my influence as portfolio holder to try to come up for it with a budget, a budget which balances, because if you end up in a situation where you try and spend money you don't have, then you end up cutting willy-nilly at the last minute. And for me, the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning is, I suppose, trying to make Oxford a fairer place. Certainly, I think that goes for my colleagues as well. You know, we're appalled at levels of inequality in our city, at poverty. We want to do what we can to help. You know, that's why, you know, long after, frankly, many other councils stopped uh, funding advice services, and, of course, uh, we did see the legal aid cuts uh, uh, happening under the coalition government as well. Um, we've, we've tried to do it. But at the same time, we've got our statutory services that we need to carry on providing. It's going to be a really difficult budget riot round. Now, I'm not going to get into the kind of business of saying I'm going to prioritise this thing, that thing, or the other thing. Um, I think my values are pretty clear on this. I think the values of uh, you know, colleagues in the Labour group are, are pretty clear on this. And we'll be guided by our values in what we do and what we come forward with. But it really isn't easy. And what, you know, rather than playing a game which is pick a sensitive thing, ask if we'll commit to it, and then stick it on a focus leaf and say, look, they haven't, they haven't committed to it, which I guess might be what be going on here. Instead, let's try and get a fair settlement from the government. Let's campaign together on it, because it's not right the way we're being treated. Thank you. Councillor Smoten to Councillor Turner again. This is on the use of charitable sector to provide non-statutory services. Any supplementary? Sorry, fumbling with the uh, mic button there. Um, yes, uh, given that we know uh, that uh, candle, council funding crunch is on its way, uh, and that, as you note, uh, for-profit providers are to be regarded with scepticism uh, for these kinds of services, do you agree that trying to get services onto a donor-supported base is the least worst option? Uh, isn't that something that the council should be using its leverage to achieve sooner rather than later? Councillor Turner. So the initial question was about charitable organisations, and I think what the supplementary question is doing is saying, can we leverage in funds from donors? And I suppose the premise there is that third parties will sometimes be more successful at leveraging in funds from council. I'm aware of councils, actually, who've asked uh, you know, members of the public to contribute. I mean, there have been... Uh, we've got the... We've had the sort of lottery, uh, Ox Oxford Lottery come forward um, as a way of doing some of these things. We work, of course, particularly in the field of homelessness with organisations mm -hmm. work in close partnership where they will leverage in support from elsewhere. But I'd, I'd slightly want to distinguish between um, outsourcing services to other providers and, you know, if something's really important, um, then saying, you know, we'll, we'll give it to a charity um, and then somehow they'll have to get in the funds and instead working in partnership with others um, for a shared goal, which, of course, we're open to. We've got a really, really good record of doing. Um, you know, advice, actually, and I'll bring it to a close there, Lord Mayor, but it's another good example where we've got independent charities that we support, we work with, uh, and there are good advice outcomes provided in Oxford. Thank you. Um, now we switch to Leisure and Parks. Question from Councillor Pegg to Councillor Mongkonge on protecting river users. Do you have a supplement? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask if uh, you think that social media and posters are adequate to mitigate the dangers of the waterways that were highlighted in the Waterways Coordinator's report? Um, thank you very much uh, for the um, question. Uh, social media is just one part of the response. We have got uh, posters as well, and we recently uh, participated in the... Um, in the uh, drowning uh, prevention week. So social media is just part of it. Thank you. Um, again, from Councillor Peck to Councilman Conge, Waterways report safety issues. Do you have any supplementary? Thank you very much. And then from another new councillor, Councillor Madiman to Councillor Munkonge, repairs to Tumbling Bay. Do you have a supplementary? 
Um, councillor, at the recent meeting in June, I understand officers committed to clearing reeds from the upper part of Tumbling Bay and a third of the reeds from the lower part of Tumbling Bay. Will you take advantage of the current very low water levels to make sure this work is done before the summer? Thank you very much. Uh, the work is do uh, being done this week. Thank you. Um, nice quick action from another new councillor, Councillor Morris to Councillor Aziz on Town Hall Public Community Hub. Do you have a supplement? Uh, yes, I'm um, sorry. Well, um, I apologise for clearly misunderstanding uh, what was proposed, but perhaps uh, we might think about considering that as an option for the future. So thank, thank you very much for your question. Um, We've already stated that we do not have an application in at the moment for a public community hub, but very happy to discuss it further with you and speak to officers and come back to you. Thank you. Councillor Jarvis to Councillor Aziz about the Stunningford House development, and I did read the missing bit just before, so it was complete in what Councillor Aziz has responded. Did you have a supplementary? I do, yes. Um, thank you. And um, thank you um, to Councillor Aziz for the uh, useful background information as to the conversations that have already taken place between community groups um, based in East Oxford Community Centre and some of those um, on Cave Street. Um, I would note, however, that the, the uh, response we have um, in the papers does not respond to the question itself, which I'm going to give the, the portfolio holder an opportunity to respond to now, which was, as was read earlier, will the portfolio holder agree to a meeting with the groups based at the, the community centre and East Oxford councillors to look at potential solutions to the problems facing the group during the redevelopment? Thank you very much for the question. As you're aware, uh, as a portfolio holder, I've been giving regular updates and detailed updates to all members on this situation. And meetings, discussions, and dialogue continues. So at this moment in time, we are not looking to organize a meeting in the way that you've asked right now, but I can look into that for later on um, after the summer and get back to you. Thank you. And then from Councillor Pegg to Councillor Aziz, updating council policies for trans and non-binary inclusion. Do you have a supplementary? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, so uh, does the EDI steering group that's mentioned in the answer um, have representatives from the communities that it's working on behalf of? And if it doesn't, um, how are you engaging members of, the, of these communities in the work that that steering group is doing? So, Councillor Pope, first of all, thank you for your question and your strong interest in these issues. As we know, this is a, a very challenging time for trans people, uh, especially because of the quite shameful political narrative around their rights. So I do appreciate you constantly um, raising this. Uh, I will need to double check um, who if there is a representative from the community on the EDI steering group. But I would like to assure you that we have, uh, we continue to ensure that our steering groups are as representative and as diverse as possible. So to be factually clear and accurate, I would need to go and check that and then get back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we have, again, from Councillor Peck to Councillor Aziz about East Oxford Community Centre gender-neutral gender toilet provision. Do you have a supplementary? Uh, yeah, it's just to clarify if there'll also be gender-neutral toilets at the Cave Street redevelopment. So again, thank you for your question, and I will need to make sure that my response is factually accurate, so I'd have to check that and then get back to you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we move to the Cabinet Member for Safer Communities, Councillor Walcott. And from Councillor Rule to Councillor Walcott on modern slavery definition, do you have any supplementary? No, thank you. Um, uh, then from Councillor Jarvis to Councillor Walcott on the rights of Gypsy Roma and Traveller people. Do you have a supplementary? I do, yes. Um, it's just a quick one, which is that um, since the policing bill has become the Policing Act and effectively criminalised Gypsy, Gypsy Roma and Traveller's traditional way of life, has anything changed in the Council's approach um, to this? Sorry, could you repeat the last bit? I didn't quite hear that. Sorry, yeah, it was just to, to, to ask whether anything has changed in the Council's approach um, since the passing of the Act. 
So with the passing of the Act, we're working a lot more intentionally to really understand what more we can do to best support our communities living within the city. We understand that the policing bill actually involves some of the over-policing and part of our conversation is actually ensuring that we're mitigating that and actually that this is a city where everyone can feel included and is able to thrive. So happy to bring that back to another council meeting if that would be a benefit or we can catch up offline. Thank you very much. Now for the Cabinet Member for Housing, Councillor Linda Smith from Councillor Malik. A number of Afghan refugee families housed to date. Do you have a supplementary? From Councillor Rawl to Councillor Smith, the number of rough sleepers in Oxford. No supplementary. Thank you. From Councillor Rawl to Councillor Smith, social housing repairs and improvement waiting times. You have a supplementary? Yes, I do. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you so much for the detailed response, and I don't expect you to necessarily have the numbers here, but I was just wondering whether um, you would also be able to share the figures for the waiting times of maybe not necessarily repairs, but larger scale jobs such as um, ramps for accessibility, so rather improvements rather than um, uh, repairs. Yeah, as you said, um, you know, I don't have those figures to hand, but if you'd, particularly if you'd like to clarify what figures you, you would like after the meeting, then I'll certainly obtain those for you. Thank you very much. Um, then we have from Councillor Falweather to Councillor Smith on HMO enforcement with Oxford Brooks. Any supplementary? No, thank you very much. And then on to planning and housing delivery from Councillor Malik to Councillor Hollingsworth about Ifley Meadow. Any supplementary? Yeah, th thanks for the detailed uh, answer. Uh, no, I, w when this land was brought by uh, City Council on company and I thought uh, it falls in line in uh, your policy of the diversity because we remember spending money in a broad street meadow to create an artificial meadow. So I'm slightly baffled. Don't you think council owns it? I know it's in a local plan, and we, ha we have a pressure on housing. Nobody denies it. Wouldn't these places make Oxford better, keeping those green spaces? Councillor Hollingsworth. Um, to reiterate the two points made in the uh, original answer, um, when the local plan is made, um, the housing need for the city uh, is one of the required um, inputs um, into that plan. There is a requirement to meet the housing need. It's, it's laid down um, uh, in law. Um, the City Council then identifies uh, as many sites as it possibly can um, to uh, meet that need. The then owner of this site proposed it for housing development, and after uh, two full rounds of consultation, detailed uh, assessment by our own city council officers and the public inquiry, um, it was included as a housing site um, in, the lo uh, in the local plan. Those decisions are always difficult. They're difficult whenever you assign new housing, but then um, every single house uh, in this city was once a green field. All of those decisions were difficult. Um, uh, it's, it's a question of balancing the, the needs of past generations, current generations, uh, and, uh, and future generations, and that's what the local plan process does. The then owners of the site, um, having uh, had the site allocated, um, as is their right to put it up for sale, um, it was acquired by the City Council's wholly owned housing company um, at a price commensurate with a, la a piece of land which had been allocated um, uh, for housing within a local plan and uh, an appropriate planning application will be brought forward in, I hope, the very soon, very near future. Thank you very much. And then another from Councillor Malik to Councillor Hollingsworth, renaming of the Council Housing Company. Any supplement? No, thank you very much. Then from Councillor Morris to Councillor Hollingsworth on the affordable homes target. Any supplementary? No, thanks very much. And then from you to Councillor Hollingsworth, innovative ways for strong environmental performance in new building developments. Any supplementary? No, thanks very much. Councillor Pegg to Councillor Hollingsworth, cost of OCHL rebrand. Supplement? Uh, yeah, I was just to ask um, if it didn't cost a council any money for the rebrand, how much did it cost OCHL? 
I, I foresaw that that was the question you were going to ask because the way I drafted it looked as if I was being evasive and I wasn't. Um, the second paragraph, perhaps if I'd written it a bit better, basically what it, what, it's, what it says is that the cost is nil because there was a marketing budget uh, assigned. Um, so we would have spent the same, or the company rather, would have spent the same amount of money anyway. Um, the, the view of the company, and I'm, I, I support that view, is that this is a more effective way of spelling it. The OCHL is frankly, an, you know, it doesn't reach out and grab customers. And of course, the purpose of the company is to sell um, both at market rate, but also shared ownership in a competitive market where there's, where there's other people doing the same thing. OX Place, um, with its branding, uh, I think is a better way. It's likely to uh, increase uh, the speed of sales. I think that's probably the, the thing here. Um, those of you who read Private Eye will realize that um, councils can set up housing companies which fail to sell houses, and the results are pretty calamitous. I do not want that to happen if our directors think, and I think rightly, um, that OX Place will enable <clears throat> the company to sell its houses and its homes more quickly, more effectively, um, and get them off the books and get the money in, uh, and indeed, most importantly of all, get residents and families housed, then that's a good thing. So um, it, it cost the company nothing either, either, other than the obvious thing, there was a marketing budget which it was going to spend anyway, they're just spending it like this. Thank you. Um, from Councillor Smoten to Councillor Hollingsworth on homes from infrastructure, Osney Mead, Oxbends Bridge. Any supplementary? Uh, considering that the proposed bridge is two minutes on foot or 30 seconds by bicycle uh, from the uh, ends of the existing Gasworks Railway Bridge, can we really justify a best case four minute journey time reduction uh, for six million pounds? Uh, surely there must be better places in Oxford to make use of that funding. Well, well, first of all, as, as um, the numerous reports make clear, this is a county council uh, uh, project which the city council is delivering. Um, so it's not up to us necessarily to decide where and where, where precisely, uh, where it should go in the strategic sense. That being said, it is in our local plan uh, as a requirement of the local plan um, to enable the uh, development of the uh, Osney Mead site. Um, I would challenge your times. I mean, I don't cycle massively uh, slowly, but I don't think I could do those uh, times. Um, the uh, railway bridge uh, requires very substantial infrastructure works to bring it up to standard, um, which would, uh, would, would be required anyway. Uh, and the um, requirement is for a, a particular um, crossing which could provide the potential for a dry uh, weather route um, uh, between the two, uh, sorry, a wet weather route uh, between, the two, uh, between the two sites, which um, uh, the, the current one would not. Um, if it were developed, the, um, uh, the, there would be a greater impact, um, sorry, if the, if, the, um, if the routes were developed up to the appropriate standard, there would be a greater impact on the Grand Pont Nature Reserve than with the proposed bridge, um, and indeed an impact potentially um, on the land, uh, the Meadows in Trust, uh, on the um, northern side of the river. Um, so for all of those uh, reasons, I think that the project, as outlined to us and do, uh, given transferred to us um, by the County Council, is a good and effective one. It will be up to the County Council uh, um, to decide um, whether we proceed. Um, we've been required to take it through to planning and design stage, and that is what we will do. Thank you. Um, now we have, uh, is it three questions, all called local plan and jobs from Councillor Smoten. Um, so, on the first one, do you have a supplementary? I'll give you one supplementary uh, for the price of three, or the other way around, I suppose. <laughs> Whichever one is better. Uh, so, I asked whether it was important for housing growth to outstrip commercial growth. We had some talk about that uh, today already. Uh, the opening of the response is a, is a flat no. Um, you cited earlier in the day, uh, earlier in the evening, sorry, uh, the peri-urban developments, uh, but you'll obviously be aware uh, that two of those similarly have very significant commercial developments and therefore demand sinks associated with them, leaving very little in total. Uh, but our local plan is predicated on unmet housing need, which implies a need for our supply to, uh, supply to outpace demand. Aren't these positions contradictory? Uh, at the end of the day, don't you need to be able to deliver that excess supply? Councillor Hollingsworth. Okay, I'll try and, try and give a, a fairly, fairly short answer. I suppose the short-ish answer is that this is the kind of strategic planning 
um, uh, question, which uh, should and could have been uh, dealt with by the regional planning structures and systems which existed up until 2010 and then were abolished by a government made up of two parties. Sorry, I didn't need to go that way, but since I'm there, I will. Um, uh, the uh, Oxfordshire 2050 plan offers an opportunity uh, to address these kinds of uh, strategic spatial issues in the location uh, of uh, jobs and of housing uh, and the balance uh, between the two uh, across Oxfordshire. My point, uh, and I think this echoes the point made previously uh, by the leader, um, is that to treat Oxford as if it was surrounded by nothing um, and that the ratio within Oxford was the only thing that mattered is, as I've said, grossly uh, simplistic. Um, the assumption is that in that is that uh, somehow the economy can be switched off and jobs can be moved and the evidence uh, for that is, is just non-existent. Um, if you look at the current levels of demand for um, office space and laboratory space, particularly in the city. If you look at the uh, um, quarterly reports from the major planning consultancies, the major property consultancies, even in a, point, a time of, frankly, probably impending recession, um, then it is quite clear that there will be jobs in Oxfordshire it is a question of where they go. And I think it is absolutely abundantly clear to me that the most sustainable option for jobs is where there are public transport nexuses, where there are opportunities for people to reach them by walking and by cycling. Because the alternative is to have them in the countryside on estates reached only by cars. And the assumption... You... Yes, I am winding up, Lord Mayor. The assumption uh, that, that, that you make that somehow you can't have jobs is one that I, I think is absolutely wrong. King Knut, uh, a very wise uh, king, uh, demonstrated uh, that, not necessarily with jobs, but the general principle, um, some thousand years ago, and I think perhaps you might want to reflect on his message. Um, I had been hoping that we would have got through this section, it says in my... A guide that we have up to three hours for this particular item of um, motions on, uh, sorry, questions on notice. I mean, we're not going to take three hours, but there's still quite a few to be answered. I hope there were not too many supplementaries, but, sorry, Susanna. Excuse me, Lord, I thought it was half an hour for this item. No, it says here it's um, no time limit for this particular item. Uh, says maximum potential three hours. Well, it was 58 questions. So 58, two and two, two supplementary, two for the answer. So anyhow, it's more than three hours. So anyhow, I'm going to suggest that since we were meant to have a break at 6.30, since it's going to take us some time to finish this, that we take our break now, we reconvene at 7.00, and then we continue after that. I hope that's acceptable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm just going to explain, because I'll forget otherwise, why am I wearing this curious thing around my neck, which is actually a walnut. Um, I was inducted into the Confrérie de la Noir de Grenoble on Saturday at the Botanic Garden. And since I am not allowed, apparently, it's not custom to wear the gold chain, I thought I should wear something for this meeting. I probably will never wear it again, but anyhow, I am a member of the Confrérie de la Noir de Grenoble. So be impressed. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. We now are continuing with the questions and uh, for members. So I think the next one is from Councillor Fawether to Alex Hollingsworth on community infrastructure levy funding decision-making. Do you have any supplementary? Um, yes, I do. Um, thank you for the comprehensive answer. Um, 
It starts off by saying there's no separate CIL infrastructure list. When I went to the uh, website to have a look, um, it says the CIL regulation 123 list is now to be renamed the CIL infrastructure list. Could he clarify that, please? Yes, it's in, it's in the answer I've, I've given. Um, the um, uh, Regulation 123 list, which was widely un misunderstood to be a thing, list of things which were to be funded with SIL and was not, um, and was in fact a list of things which could no longer be funded by Section 106 uh, funding, um, uh, was abolished by the, uh, where were they? the Community Infrastructure Levy Amendment England Number no. 2 Regulations 2019, otherwise known as the 2019 SIL Regulations, uh, and that was replaced with the requirement to have an infrastructure funding statement. The infrastructure funding statement says what SIL funds have been spent on or will be spent on in the future. Um, it is essentially reporting what has been uh, approved to be in the council's budget. The critical part of the question, of the answer, is that how is SIL money spent? It is spent as part of the capital programme of the budget and at no other time other than by special reports uh, as and when. But there is no separate pot of money. There is no separate list of schemes. There, you only have your one bite at the cherry, sorry. Um, we now move on to uh, Councillor Chapman as the Cabinet Member, from Councillor Malik to Councillor Chapman, face-to-face -face queries from the public. Yeah, th thank you, Lord Mayor. Thanks for the answer. Uh, the reason I ask the question is I appreciate uh, not everybody have the technology to go online. COVID has changed many lifestyles, like Councillor Turner was alluding earlier, and people can more work remotely, home, etc. But the issue here is this council has a vision to be a world-class city, and world-class city and being a city council, and also one of the things provided is to provide the service. I don't know if you noticed or not, when you go to this uh, place you refer where the office is, there is no privacy. That place is not adequate for this kind of services. If one person having a conversation, any confidential, the other can overhear that. So the place is very limited. And I think, would you kindly uh, revisit and have a look if you can find a space even in town hall, and rather than three, this sh service should be five days. Thank you. Councillor Chapman. Well, I understand the point being made, and you're quite right, there has to be a balance between face-to-face -face services, those provided by telephone and those provided online. But just to give a bit of context here, you know, the number of visitors coming is almost at the same level as it was when we were doing this five days a week. So people are coming in decent numbers, which is a good thing. Um, in terms of the privacy, I will take a look at it, but all I would say, Councillor Malik, is the satisfaction levels of those who are coming and coming off the street spontaneously and having these conversations is running at about 96%, which is pretty hard to beat. So all the evidence is it is working. I will take it away, but I don't think there's a great deal of opportunity for a wholesale rethink of it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Landel Mills, Councillor Chapman on rare and protected plant species. Any supplementary? Uh, thank you for his answer. No, no supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, from Councillor Pegg to Councillor Chapman, ODS guidance on protecting green space is supplementary. No, thanks, that's great. Councillor Morris to Councillor Chapman, ODS community street champions, supplementary. Uh, yes, hello. Um, yeah, just, a, just a, a, another point. Um, again, I, uh, uh, may I, I may have misunderstood, but... Uh, I did think the series of um, uh, roadshows you put on recently for the cost of living uh, program was were, were very good and very well received. So thank you for that. But um, I, am I under the misunderstanding that the uh, Home Improvement Agency can only deal with um, uh, people who are actual actually council tenants and council owned properties for improvements in their house in their house? Because I was under the impression that they could also give advice to private um, householders as well. Council. That's an interesting technical question, Council, which I would have to go away and, and research. Um, but maybe the Council Councillor, uh, yes, Linda Smith. Uh, 
agency comes under my portfolio is actually the opposite to what you're describing. Uh, our improvement agency is, is there to um, support tenant, uh, or people in private accommodation, not uh, council members. Thank you for the extra clarification. Um, from Councillor Muddiman to Councillor Chapman on single-use plastics update. Any supplementary, please? Um, single-use plastics are still being used by our street traders. This policy is not being enforced. What steps will you take to ensure that it is enforced? Well, obviously, we, if we have cases brought to our attention where it's not being properly applied, then, of course, we will look into them. But I think we need to balance here... Um, explaining, encouraging, engaging before we enforce, because we've got to get this in a level of proportion. So uh, that's all I would basically say in response. But if you've got specific cases and specific concerns about individual traders who you feel have been given sufficient time to, to apply with the policy, then I, then I and I'm sure officers would like to know about them. And obviously we're going to have an opportunity later in the meeting to debate the wider issues around this uh, later on tonight. Thank you. Um, from Councillor Landall Mills to Councillor Chapman on hedgehog preservation, are there any supplementary? A modest question, which is really a request, that he, um, he writes to the Hedgehog Society and requests their advice. Well, Councillor, actually I spent some time on the Hedgehog Preservation Society website today in anticipation of your question. Uh, and, and, and actually I discovered some interesting things, one of which was actually that urban hedgehogs are having a new nadir, a new zenith rather, they're having a new flourishing, it's wonderful. So actually the, the situation with hedgehog uh, preservation is less about urban centres and more about the rural areas of which there are not many in Oxford. So I'm, I will no doubt have a further look at it, but I didn't think from my initial reading this afternoon, there was lots of new advice they could offer us. Thank you. Um, next one from Councillor Miles to Councillor Chapman on outsourced recycling any supplementary yes thank you very much and uh, for those of you who have not seen it there is an annex to this which details the breakdown of outsourced recycling to um, whether it's processed in the UK versus um, exported and now NMP which is a company that we outsource to say that they aim to minimize the distance any materials travel for waste processing now I recognize that the end destinations can vary and acknowledge um, there is this breakdown of materials that you provided but could you please provide further details and example countries of where these materials, so we're talking about metals, paper cards and plastics, are being sent for processing by N&P, because I believe that you have that information available. Thank you. Councillor Chapman. Well, that level of detail is quite specific, and therefore I need some time to go off and research that. I can I'll give you the overall percentages, but specific countries, we would need to go back and do some more work. So I'm very happy to do that. Uh, with the support of uh, Officer Mishtala, and we'll do that for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. From Councillor Smoten to Councillor Chapman, ODS Highways Engineering Provision. Supplementary? No supplementary. Thank you. From Councillor Fowether to Councillor Chapman on the area and QL system. Any supplementary? Thank you. And again, on the same topic, any second supplementary? No? Thank you. Okay, now we're moving on to the to Councillor Thomas as the Cabinet Member. From Councillor Malik to Councillor Thomas, latest pollution and air quality data. Any supplementary? Thank you very much. From Councillor Rawl to Councillor Thomas, um, occupancy rates within city centre retail properties. Any supplementary? Yes, I do. Thank you. To mean you. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you so much for the response. I was just, I noticed that in the response it says um, the national average of empty units, but I just wondered whether we have any idea of the, our, our rates compared to other cities similar to Oxford, recognising the decimation of the high street in the East Coast, North, Midlands, which may skew that national data. Thank you. Um, it's specific enough that I think it would benefit from a more detailed, but yeah, if the question is, would you like, can I provide you with some more detail on that, I'm happy to go away and take that back to you, um, provide a written response, and if it's helpful, can flag that in Council of Future, so for the benefit of other members. Thank you very much. From Councillor Miles to Councillor Thomas, air pollution monitoring, any supplementary? Thank you very much. Councillor Kerr. Your first question, thank you, to Councillor Thomas. Impact of Council ZEZ? No further questions. 
Thank you very much. Councillor Miles to Councillor Thomas on street trees. Any supplementary? No. Um, Councillor Pegg to Councillor Thomas, grass mowing policy. Supplementary? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, who has decided that um, cutting grass once a month is infrequent enough to be beneficial for wildlife? It seems like that's actually quite often. Um, and is the council collecting the cuttings from when it mows? Okay, so um, this is something that has been not just in local press, but in national press recently, that I've, I've talked to local and national press about recently as well. Um, and it's, it is, as ever, a balancing act. It's something that I'm really proud that Oxford has been ahead of the curve on and that we've been trialling longer grass verges um, for the last couple of years. And part of that in, in some of our smaller streets has been that we've had, a, we've had trial areas where we have... Um, let, allowed grass to grow and done one single cut late in summer, which I'm sure um, the council opposite understands is, is beneficial for biodiversity in terms of balancing the nutrient levels and allowing for seed germination. Um, in those areas, we do remove the cuttings, um, and that, that meant that we had to purchase equip specialist equipment in, in order to enable us to do that. So I'd really encourage everybody, everybody in the room, really, um, to go away and look at our biodiversity action plan and some of the ste steps taken there. So I'm really proud of our policies. It's also, it is a balancing act in terms of public perception. Um, and that's why I'm so glad this has been in the national press. And that's why I've been really engaging on this. Because a lot of people do still see it as the, the bread and butter of council for us to be keeping things looking neat and tidy. And what I would really like to see is a change in perception, for people to look again and see something they previously would have considered scruffy and actually see the beauty in the, wild, in the wilderness. I think that we really need a, we need a big comms campaign on this. We, um, we need to see action in schools to um, encourage understanding of biodiversity. We need to see ODS um, being trained to spot uh, beautiful orchids that might be rare. And Can you... Cut it short. <laughs> Very passionate about this, but um, but I'm I'm really proud of the direction we're going in here. I think I think we do need to move fast because it's climate change and we don't have time to lose. But I'm I think we're going in the right direction. Thank you very much. Um, then Councillor Miles to Councillor Thomas. Air pollution from commercial cooking. No supplementary. Thank you. And then moving on now to Councillor Upton as the cabinet member. From Councillor Kerr to Councillor Upton, East Oxford LTN vandalism, no supplementary, thanks. Uh, and then another one, but this is on East Oxford LTN traffic regulations, none, thanks. From Councillor Morris to Councillor Upton, occupancy rate of existing cycle parking provision, supplementary? No, thanks very much. Um, Councillor Smoton to Councillor Upton, ZEZ and theatres? No supplementary. Thank you. Councillor Smoton to Councillor Upton, backing buses. Any supplementary? Yes. Uh, can I press you specifically with regards to Holloway? Because we've, we've seen elements within Oxford Labour pushing hard for no change or at least no, no filter on that road. Um, assuming that the modelling work that you're obviously quite right to request were to show the anticipated benefits, will you push back? Um. Yes, as I said in the answer, I'm delighted you've been following our branches' motions, but if you followed what our constituency Labour Party motion was, it actually, we, we removed that line about um, objecting to the Holloway one, precisely because, um, you know, the, the opposition, I think the people who initially voted for that were opposed to it because they had not seen any data to show why it was necessary. Um, but our very strong position is that if, if there's data to show that it is necessary, then we will accept that it is in. Absolutely. If the data sh modelling data shows it isn't necessary, then we will not be in favour of it. Um, I mean, I think that, that there's different views on... Without seeing data, lots of people have different views, OK? Um, for example, I, I think one of our Green colleagues over there was against, campaigned against one of the Marston Ferry Road filters, for example, presumably because having not seen data, they thought it wasn't a viable one. So um, our position certainly will be that if the data shows it is necessary, we will be uh, entirely behind it. Thank you. Um, Councillor Fellwether to Councillor Upton on Westgate Car Park. Any supplement? No, thank you. Um, same councillor to same cabinet member. Seacourt Park and Ride supplementary. Um, 
and I should say I'm quite happy to have these figures in a written answer afterwards. Um, it's taken a very long while, but could we know exactly how long it's been left empty? Where does this leave the payback period, and how much has it now cost? Uh, thank you for giving me the let-out clause that you're happy to get a written answer later. Obviously, those kind of details I'll need to check with officers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good answer. Councillor Miles to Councillor Upton, EV charging point. Supplementary? Yes, thank you. Um, you state the charging point will be replaced in the coming months. Can you con confirm and commit to a specific timeline so that I can inform residents? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Miles, I will, um, can't give you one now, um, but as soon as we know, you will be the first person to hear. Okay. Thank you very much. We've now, I believe, completed... The, I believe it's 58 questions, anyhow, uh, an awful lot of questions and answers, so thank you very much. Um, we can now move on to the public addresses and questions, and there are some people outside. Um, may I invite, I think maybe together, Roseanne Postock and Julie Kleeman. Hello, hello, Roseanne and uh, Julie. That's nothing personal. They are officers who finished their tasks here, so they are allowed to go. They're not councillors. Um, and you have, I believe you know, a total of five minutes between you. And I've suggested that halfway through, if you, Roseanne, have not finished, we just give you an indication. You're halfway through. Thank you very much. Right. Hello. Um, we, we started OxClean in 2006. Um, about 10 years ago, we ran a campaign to investigate street trading. And what we discovered was that it's a very useful facility for students and people. It provides good, hot, cheap food. So we didn't want to prevent it. But um, what we felt was, and we also looked into recycling. Now, I gather that the recycling boxes have vastly improved. Um, but what this is still isn't enough. And um, over the last years, I've become increasingly keen on behavioral change. And in order to get behavioral change, as you'll see from <clears throat> advertising, not to say take back control, um, it, what we would like to see on the, on the boxes is in, in letters up to two inches high, or three centimeters, um, please bin me, bin me. Um, this would really help to nudge the, the people who use these, uh, the street trading. And um, the other thing is to have plenty of bin, bins, um, windproof, animal proof, in the vicinity, well emptied, so that people can actually use the bins. There's no point in having please bin me and no bins around. So this is what we would like to see uh, very, very much indeed. And your support for this would be very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Julie, and my business um, is it's a street food business, or we started out that way. It's called Taste Tibet, and we were a street food stall in Gloucester Green for many years before we opened our restaurant takeaway in East Oxford. And um, back in the day, back in 2014, we were the first trader to be using food boxes, cutlery, napkins, etc., that were made of um, fully recyclable or compostable materials. Nobody else in the market was doing that. But shortly after we, we started trading there, there was um, a new motion introduced to ensure that traders were using recycled or at least par par recycled boxes. Um, here in Oxford, any street trader was required to do that. But it became clear very quickly that, that this was not being enforced. Um, something that we felt really passionate about and put on all our signage because it was like a selling point. It was something that we were proud of and 
people who came to our store were proud to, to buy into, but other traders in the market continued to use styrofoam boxes or other single-use plastics. And the um, market managers were um, played it down and said that they were just using up existing stocks. And it would appear that that continues to be the case because even though we're aware now, uh, we're not in Gloucester Green anymore, but we know that there are, are traders there and elsewhere in Oxford who continue to use these single-use plastics or non-regenerative materials um, many, many years after the fact. And it's just something that we feel really passionate is entirely possible. We were having a conversation just now in the back room about how, um, you know, back in the day it was quite difficult to find boxes that suited the, the food that, the food type, maybe something sloppy, hot, liquidy. But these days it's a very, very um, competitive um, business. There's lots and lots of options. There's absolutely no reason why everybody shouldn't be doing as we do. So, yeah, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to come and speak about something I'm really passionate about. Thank you. Don't, don't go yet. I'm going to invite Dika Walcott, the Cabinet member, to respond. Thank you for joining us here today on what is undoubtedly the hottest day of the year to talk about something that's really important, which is environmental policy. So I'm really glad to, to have you here and to have so many comrades also in the room. So the Council welcomes initiatives and suggestions to reduce the environmental impact on our city. The issue of sustainability and the use of recyclable packaging is addressed in the current street trading policy and in the conditions attached to consents as follows. So the Environmental Protection Act of 1990, as amended, places a duty of care on businesses to dispose of their trade waste in an appropriate manner. Trade waste must be stored appropriately and must be disposed of by a licensed waste carrier. No water or waste material shall be discharged onto the highway or any adjacent property. The consent holder shall take reasonable steps to ensure that the litter arising from their own trade is minimised as far as possible. For example, making a bin available for customers to use as you have kindly suggested and pointed out to all of us, so thank you. When submitting applications for a new consent or renewal, all applicants must provide a valid waste transfer note, and food traders are also subject to the following condition. All packaging and utensils for use by customers shall be made of recycled or part recycled materials. Gloucester Green Market is exempt from requiring street trading consent, as stated in the current street trading policy. The Gloucester Green Weekly Markets and the Covered Market are outside of the scope of our street trading scheme. Gloucester Green has chartered charter market status, and trading in the covered market takes place from permanent shop units. We do investigate any complaints of breaches of conditions of traders causing nuisance, and will be taking the appropriate action. Our enforcement policy is to employ the four E's, which are to engage, explain, encourage, and enforce. We encourage residents, traders, and all interested parties to engage with the council using our street trading at oxford.gov.uk email. You can also contact myself. Thank you very much. Um, so we're now moving on to the next um, two uh, addresses of, from two people in Bertie Park, Martin Hackett and Lillian Sherwood. Please invite them in. Hello. Um, Hello. You have a total of five minutes between you. We understand that. And do you want us, if it's halfway through, to indicate? No. no that's fine. Okay. okay. Thanks. The clock starts ticking now. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bertie Park is a small, well-used recreation ground near the Redbridge Park and Ride, which OCC would like to redevelop as housing. We're members of the Save Bertie Park campaign. We'd like to, come to complain about the Council's poor communication with our community. We requested an update in January. We had to wait two months for postcards to be delivered to the houses closest to the park, announcing your intention to share designs with us in 2022. Well, it's now July, and we still have no news. The roles that people can play in decision-making can be seen as a spectrum from informing, to consulting, to involving, to collaborating, to empowering. In the face of a growing democratic deficit, it's not clear why OCC remains proudly to the left of this spectrum. You've told us many times that there have been extensive consultations, particularly in preparation for the, local, the 2036 local plan. 
During these consultations, our closest drop-in event was at the South Oxford Farmers Market. People at our end of the ward can, can hardly afford to shop there. Those who do don't depend on Bertie Park. You engage directly with the South Oxford Residents Association, but we'd never heard of them. When you spoke at the South Oxford Forum in 2019, many residents only found out because Carol Thorne leafleted the local area. No consultation materials were provided, but there was broad resistance to the proposals. And this was the start of our campaign. The local plan consultation booklet there was a single question about whether OCC should consider building on greenfield sites, including underused and or poor quality recreational land. 245 people answered this question. A majority disagreed or strongly disagreed. One person commented that how poor quality and underused green spaces are defined is a very sensitive issue and community consultation is vital. So, what does OCC do when it gathers information that it doesn't like? Anyone really trying to engage with the consultation was faced with a huge amount of poorly written, often contradictory documentation. So, only two people commented on the Bertie Park proposals. OCC claimed to take these comments into account by allocating the smaller part of the site, site A in the plan, for a school or residential development, with a larger part, site B, to be used for replacement recreational facilities, which is what you were going to do anyway. But now you've changed your mind, and you want to squeeze both the development and the recreational facilities onto site A. Is it any wonder there's a democratic defi deficit in Oxford? If OCC really wanted to know what we thought about the Bertie Park proposals, you could ask our community. This is what we intend to do as soon as you publish your designs. In your written response, maybe you'd like to persuade us that you're not targeting Bertie Park because it's at the poorer end of the ward. This is what many in our community believe. I live in the lower south end of Hinksy Park Ward. The council did not inform or consult us about plans to build on Bertie Park. We did not find out until summer 2019. That was when members of Save Bertie Park campaign first put up posters and delivered leaflets. I asked the council why we had not been informed. This is part of the exchange I had. Council, you have your playground in Fox Crescent. So am I being told that we can only use the tiny hard standing playground? Council, we only need to inform residents in the houses closest to the park. They are the ones who will be affected. Correction, all of us in the lower south end of the ward will be affected. Council, there have been consultations. There will be another one when the plans are drawn up. Where, when, and how will this happen? The top north end of the ward has massive Hinksy Park. We only have Little Bertie Park, and you want to make it even smaller. The majority of residents there are strongly against the plans. Bertie Park is very important to the health and well-being of us all. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, we have a written response in the papers, but I think Councillor Hollingsworth will respond now in person. Uh, yeah, and, and the, the point I'm going to make, I think, is quite an important one. Um, the site at Bertie Place wasn't first allocated for development in the current local plan. That's local plan... 2036. It was in fact allocated for the building of a school or if the school was not required for the building of housing in the previous iteration, the Sites and Housing Plan 2011-2026. That was a formal document which went through multiple stages of public consultation during the preceding years and was finally adopted by the City Council in 2013 as part of its then local plan. That allocation, with the same uses, was carried forward into the current Oxford Local Plan 2036, which was adopted in 2020 after several years of consultation, including leaflet drops to every single household in the city, as well as numerous events across the city. The County Council, who was Education Authority, had requested that the site be reserved for the possible use as a school. 
confirmed that a new school was no longer required, meaning that the allocation was now for housing. And that was the only change in the designation of the site between the sites and housing plan adopted in 2013, nine years ago, and the 2036 local plan adopted in 2020. Following several stages of informal consultation, the City Council's wholly owned housing company is finalising its designs for the site, ready for a formal consultation to all nearby households, um, which can be uh, as wide as, as, as possible, I hope, and the planning application will be submitted in the early autumn. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending. Um, for the next item, uh, which is down as being from Need Not Greed Oxfordshire, I gather that no one is present actually to ask the question, and there is a written answer in our papers. I just wonder whether Councillor Hollingsworth would like, if anything, to read it out or elaborate upon it. And in view of the time and the view of the fact there's no questioner here, um, I'm sure all members of the council will be grateful that I won't and they can read it for themselves. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, then we have a question from Dennis Gregory on greyhound racing in Oxford. Hello, please. Hello. <clears throat> Good evening, members. Um, how much council funding, direct or indirect, has been or might be deployed to bring back Greyhound Racing to the Sandy Lane Stadium? In particular, are any council funds earmarked to ensure that the health and welfare of the Greyhounds will be independently monitored and reported on? Thank you. Can Councillor Turner, I think, is responding, please. <clears throat> Thanks. So there was an extra bit at the end. But, so first of all, uh, the answer to the question is, in principle, uh, none. Um, business rates apply to the stadium uh, when it operates, regardless of the precise use and the level of business rates is set by the uh, Valuation Office Agency. Um, and uh, in terms of the regulation of greyhound racing, I believe that's uh, something administered by another regulatory body, so there isn't a council budget allocated for that. I see we now, in my uh, notes, says that there is time now to debate this item. All I'm going to say is that it is fairly... That's what it says here. Not this item, Lord Mayor, the petition. It says debate. Oh, we're on, we're on, um, oh, sorry, on the petition. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I've jumped onto the petitions. Sorry, looking too far ahead. Um, so is Market Hackett here to submit the petition? Lord Mayor, if I may, I think we had received the petition last time and responded formally to the petition, so I think now we have the report. Do we not? Okay. Sorry, I'm just going to get guidance as to, because I've got notes here which imply time is set aside, and I was going to suggest that this is going to become very similar to the first motion from Mem. So, 
allowed, I'm being advised you're allowed to speak for up to five minutes on this petition. Thank you. Just correct on Nigel Gibson, not whoever it was you said first. Okay, thank you. Um, the debate this evening <coughs> is as a result of a petition which, which, which gathered. Is it on? Which gathered. Is that better? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Thank you. The debate this evening is as a result of a petition which gathered 3,138 signatures online. It's now supplemented by another 565 handwritten signatures, which I'd like to hand over, if I may. Thank you. Um, also, complementing this, 29,000 were gathered by PETA, as well as others. 35,000 in Wales, 129,000 across the UK, all asking that greyhound racing be stopped. And a PETA survey showed that 71% of Oxfordshire residents are against resuming racing. The petition itself reads, we the undersigned petition the council to work cross-party and support the development of leisure facilities at Oxford Stadium in line with the local plan but that do not involve greyhound racing or gambling. Greyhound racing failed at the old stadium in 2008. There is no widespread support for this activity across the UK or for resuming it in our city. The cruelty involved in breeding and racing greyhounds is well documented and should no longer have a part to play in a city with the prestige of Oxford. Greyhound racing has little relevance to modern society. There is an increasing awareness of the cruelty to animals that it involves and the focus on gambling and drinking needed in order to make a profit, is surely not something to be encouraged anywhere, and especially not in an area of such high deprivation as Blackbird Lees. The consequences for the greyhound involved are appalling. As well as the obvious casualties at a race, many greyhounds don't survive training and are discarded. While a small proportion may be rehomed as pets, many more simply disappear. The idea of this exploitation of animals in the 21st century jars starkly when compared to the forward-thinking ambition shown by Oxford, for example, it's moved to have the first zero emission zone in the city centre. The council designated the old stadium for leisure activities in the latest local plan. The site is currently owned by a developer and leased to someone who's planning to reopen the stadium as a venue for greyhound racing this coming August. Since the announcement, other activities have been suggested, unrelated to greyhound racing, but looking to appeal as a way of justifying operating alongside this cruel sport. As a campaign group, we've already suggested many of these activities as part of the alternative solution, and that solution would be cruelty-free. Instead of focusing on gambling and alcohol, the site can be put to much better use as a leisure facility that is inclusive, providing a range of participatory activities for all ages and disabilities, centered around Oxford's reputation as a cycling city through the development of a velodrome. This use would better reflect what people actually want from leisure activity nowadays, to stay fitter, to stay active for longer, and so have much more fulfilling lifestyles. There is a need for facilities to match these needs. The current ambition for the facility is doomed to fail. The stadium closed over 10 years ago because greyhound racing proved economically unviable. There is no reason to suggest that returning to such a use would thrive. And with failure, the developers may well then take the opportunity to argue that it's not economic and inevitably more housing should take its place. That would certainly be a justification for their investment in a land bank. But whilst more housing is welcome and desirable across Oxford, facilities to support the quality of life of the inhabitants, such as green space and leisure activities, must also be present to balance any increase in housing density. And we, and we must remember that this location has been designated by the council for leisure under the plan, so no other use. Outside London, there is nowhere between Southampton and Derby for elite level cycling. A velodrome in Oxford would be an ideal addition, adding to our heritage in and reputation for cycling. And a velodrome would support related, sustainable and complementary activity, like BMX, go-karting, climbing wall, dance, arts, cafe and a community space, and a range of other activities to support the physical and mental health for all ages and abilities. Oxford is renowned as a city of bicycles, nowadays the most convenient mode of transport with minimal impact on climate change, and being actively encouraged by both city and county councils through the latest cycle lane schemes. We need to look forward, not back. We are looking to you, our councillors, who have been voted in part to take responsibility for the health and well-being of the people of Oxford, to work together, cross-party, to support the ambition of many, and ensure remaining. that accessible, participatory, sustainable, and very green leisure activities 
are provided for the many that want and need them. I look forward to hearing you debate the issue in Council this evening. Thank you. I, I'm going to ask Susan Brown, the leader, please to respond. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, obviously, we have got this item on the agenda, so we have formally responded already to the petition, uh, and that formal response is on the agenda, um, and we will obviously um, respond as a council during the debate that we're about to have. We are allowed to debate it. However, we are going to debate this in the very first motion that we're going to be considering shortly. So if anyone wants, any member wants to say anything now, I hope you don't duplicate it when we come to the discussion of the motion. I mean, may we proceed from here to the motion? Well, we have two items before the motion, which will be, I hope, fairly brief, and then proceed to the motions. Is that acceptable? Yes. Thank you very much. So let's get on with it and go to agenda item 15, which is outside organizations. And then we've got committee chair reports and questions. Now, I don't know offhand who the committee chairs are. There's the OSP Safe for Communities. There's partnership, including Safe for Oxfordshire, and partnership and police crime, crime panel. Um, are there committee chair reports, and are there any questions? I, may we note, so please. Uh, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. On the, on the external outside bodies reports, um, if, if I may, with your permission, Lord Mayor, this is um, a question to the person who's not mentioned about something that's not on the agenda. Um, and I hope Council will forgive me for repeating myself. You can blame it on the weather. But at our meeting on the 31st of January of this year, um, we were promised in writing a report at the next meeting from the leader as our representative on the future Oxfordshire partnership. Um, at that next meeting, um, the minutes state that I sought clarification on the absence of that report. And Councillor Brown, um, very graciously, I may recall, it doesn't say that on the minutes, but that was the case, advised that this had been missed and will be brought to the next council meeting. Uh, this is the next council meeting and uh, it's been missed again. So um, I wonder if we could come to the next meeting. I'm going to have to be gracious again. I am really sorry, um, and it was missed again, and thank you for drawing it to our attention. We really must make sure, please, uh, council officers, that uh, we do get a report to the next meeting. Thank you for raising that point. Um, so that is in my papers on page 75 onwards. I hope that covers the other various uh, bodies that are mentioned there. Um, can we vote to note this and note in particular the leader's promise to make sure that we do have the response that Councillor Gant just requested? So can we vote on this, please? Those in favour? Those against? That is approved. Thank you very much. It's noted. Then we have Councillor Smoten introducing scrutiny committee report. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, again, in view of time, uh, I'll be brief. Um, uh, so, uh, I'm the new chair of Scrutiny. Councillor Diggins is the new vice chair. I believe she's absent today, is that right? Um, I won't go into the reports uh, specifically because there are 10 of them all told, uh, but I'd uh, urge uh, cabinet members and, uh, and councillors in general to, uh, to read and inwardly digest. Uh, I will call out a few points uh, of Scrutiny's business recently, uh, which should uh, attract particular thanks. Um, I'd like to uh, call out uh, uh, Councillor Jafari Marbini. Uh, uh, many thanks uh, for her contributions uh, to the Child Poverty Review Group, uh, which has reported back uh, with many and various uh, and informative uh, recommendations. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks are due to Councillor Pegg uh, for driving forward the uh, proposal for a climate and environment panel, which is due to be considered uh, at a near future scrutiny committee meeting. And finally, thanks are due to uh, Alice Courtney for stepping into the uh, formidable shoes of, uh, of Tom 
uh, nearly said Tom Hayes, you can't do that. Uh, stepping into the, the shoes of Tom Hudson. There we go. Um, th thank you very much indeed. You know, you've made my job as chair very much easier. <laughs> That's it from Scrutiny for now. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the chair? Or may we proceed to note the report and vote on that noting? All those in favor, please indicate it's clearly carried. Thank you very much indeed. And now we can proceed to the actual, uh, the various questions starting, uh, the motions from members starting with the first one, which is on the topic of greyhound racing to be proposed by Councillor Falweather. Lord Mayor, at the, at the top here, could I just raise a point of order with regards to the sequencing of the motions? Um, there's, there's been a lot of discussions back and forth on this now, so I'd appreciate some clarification from the chair. Uh, my understanding is that 17D uh, is not expected to be taken tonight and is expected to be deferred to another venue. And so, like I say, many conversations, my understanding is that that there has been a suggestion originating from the Labour Group and then adjudicated by officers and at the Lord Mayor's discretion, is that right, as to whether 17D should or shouldn't be taken tonight. If it is at the Lord Mayor's disc discretion, then considering that this had been back and forth and back and forth with officers for many weeks and many drafts had been seen, uh, could, in, if it is at your discretion, can I exhort you to permit it to be heard uh, since speeches have been prepared uh, and, uh, and public attendees uh, particularly for it? Uh, and if it's not at your discretion, I'd appreciate if you could elaborate. I have taken guidance from the, the representative legal services here. Maybe I can invite Marcia to explain the legal position, which is what ultimately is going to get our constitution and the legal uh, uh, conditions therein. So I'm going to ask you maybe please to summarise the situation. Lord Mayor, regarding the, the item 17D, um, there are two constitutional points uh, for reference here. Uh, the first is 1119 motions without notice and the second one is five, part 57B uh, of the constitution as well. Uh, just so, as, as regards uh, uh, street trading, if I may, I'll start with um, uh, 57B, which says that the council can indeed set policies around licensing, but it goes on to be more specific and explains that it is for the licensing committee to review and recommend policies on licensing and registration to the council. So the actual policies uh, uh, and uh, recommendations and the review would be done by licensing committee who would then uh, refer the matter back to council for a, a fuller decision on what they have recommended and what they have reviewed. So that's the, the first provision on which I'm, I'm referring to at your request. The second one is uh, regards 1119 motions without notice, which says there's no need to give notice of motions in relation to certain matters if we are referring something somewhere else. So those are the two provisions within the constitution which may be for consideration and deliberation now. I mean, my understanding is Sorry, sorry, my understanding is that this is in the first instance a question that should be considered by the licensing committee. The licensing committee is the body which makes decisions on which all groups are represented. So it's not as if it is a one party group. Um, it does represent the council in its breadth. And I imagine that representations can be made there regarding this policy. Um, then they come up with recommendations which will be made to the council. I understand that is the procedure in this case, and I see no reason why it should be changed because a motion has been put down which maybe was trying to jump the gun and telling the licensing committee what to do. I can see Councillor Linda Smith Thank you, wants Lord to... Mayor. I was going to do this later, but seeing as we're discussing this now, I would like to move a motion without notice that the um, motion uh, about sustainable street, street trading is referred um, somewhere else, namely to the licensing committee for the reasons you've just set out. Since 
I am advised, this is at my discretion, as Councillor Smoten said, I am guided by the legal officer in this matter, so there isn't a debate. This is going to go to a council committee. It happens to be the licensing committee, which will consider all of the representations, and then it will come back with the recommendation to this council. Are you... Are you trying to disagree with that? Dis no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream I will, of disagreeing with you. I'm guided by the uh, legal officer first. Uh, uh, Lord Mayor, just to, just to reiterate, 11.19 says motions without notice, so there's no need to give notice of motions if you wish to refer something somewhere else. It doesn't mean that you don't move to have, uh, if you like, a proposer and a seconder. Oh. Thank you. So, do I have a proposer? I'm assuming it is Councillor Linda Smith. Do we have a second? I've already proposed the motion, Lord Mayor. I yes, thank you. I suggest we take a second and move to a vote as per the Constitution. All right. Is there a seconder? Waving hands. I'll take Councillor Hollingsworth. Um, um, yes, uh, I'm allowed to, to speak no. to the motion that's just been. No, because no, I haven't seconded it yet. Let Aren't me second vote it first. on this as proposed. Can, because we are. Uh, that can was I, can the I just, could, could you explain to us why we weren't told this 10 days ago when the motion was submitted? Well, that's discourteous to the democratic process. Well, there's a constitution. I mean, that is apparently, as we heard, this is allowed under the constitution. This is a procedure that is permitted. And, uh, you know, this is... It is not as if this issue will not be debated. It will be debated in the licensing committee. May I just speak? Not here Lord Mayor, may I, Thank may I you. speak? I think we now need to go to a vote can on I, this can motion. I, no, you can't, because I haven't seconded it yet. Give you a chance. Um, um, I would like to second, it, second this, not because I have any disagreement particularly with the contents of the motion, but because this is the wrong way round to do it. The licensing committee will take evidence and, uh, on, on the issues um, uh, from interested parties, um, including existing traders, and then bring a recommendation to this council. What we would do were we to pass this is simply send it to the licensing committee to sort of like with a decision for it to do the consultation on the decision that had already been taken. It's entirely backwards. Sorry, I almost said the wrong thing there. Um, and so just trying to avoid having two rounds of debate about the same thing. It is not discourteous. Perhaps what is discourteous is to bring a motion which is properly the subject of, of the, the, the remit of the licensing committee to here to try and bypass it. But, I mean, you know, I, I was trying to be helpful. So now we have a proposer and a seconder, and we need to put it to the vote. So those in favour, please indicate. Those against? So it will proceed to the licensing committee, which will consider as is the proper process and then come with its recommendation to this committee, this council later. But that was jumping the gun. We are now meant to be discussing uh, the motion A on no greyhound racing in the city. So I'm going to invite, as I was before, Councillor Fowweather, who I believe is the proposer. And we have a seconder, yep. Thank you. So do you want to speak, please? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, and I'd just like to say a quick thank you to Mr Gregory for his uh, contribution earlier. Um, I welcome the reopening of the stadium as part of leisure activities for the people of Oxford after it being left unused for over 10 years. However, I can't support the return of greyhound racing and the problems associated with it. In 2005, Risk Capital Partners purchased the failing stadium from the Greyhound Racing Association, which despite its name was a commercial company. Greyhound racing continued until 2012. It is very curious that Risk Capital was financed by Galliard Homes in order to purchase and later wind up the Greyhound Racing Association Company, which had owned the majority of tracks in use in the 21st century, 
Many of these have now been redeveloped as housing by, you guessed it, Galliard Homes. In the 1950s, there were over 250 Greyhound racing tracks in the UK. Now there are about 20. This is clearly an activity which has had its day, as evidenced by the fact it, stopped, it had stopped in Oxford as it had become unprofitable. People, especially younger people, want more participative activities, not act passively watching dogs running round a circuit. I'm really against the return of greyhound racing for three main reasons. First of all, animal welfare. In 2019, the last full year of racing, there were 4,970 injuries to around 15,000 active greyhounds, a casualty rate of 33%. This is nearly 250 per track in operation at that time. These figures do not include injuries or deaths of non-registered animals, e.g. puppies who don't make the grade. Dog, racing dog welfare is pure, poorly regulated on and off the track, as the Parliamentary Select Committee reported when it called for better regulation and enforcement. In particular, they wanted much more data collected about injury, euthanasia and rehoming. I find it bizarre that we're allowing a so-called sport to return when we don't and wouldn't allow bear baiting, cock fighting or hair coursing, which of course is where greyhound racing originated 30 from. 30 seconds remaining. Gambling. I'm sure I don't need to tell councillors about the damage done to communities by gambling in all its forms. Unfortunately, this is an integral part of the experience of greyhound racing and can have dire results on some individuals, on their families. Suicide or attempted suicides attempt, attributed to gambling debts account for over 20% of all those who try and succeed or succeed in taking their own lives. Can you please wind up now? Okay. Active leisure. The return of dog racing at the stadium limits its use for more... Le active leisure-based activities. Oxford is a Thank you. Uh, city. Can you wind up? You've had... Oxford is a sledgeable cycling stop. city, but what are we doing to encourage this? Councillor Pegg, if she wants to take uh, up the option of being a seconder. Can I um, do my seconding speech at the end? Please. You're allowed reserve to right. yeah. reserve it. Thank you. I gather there is an amendment. Uh, would you like to propose the amendment, please? Yeah, sorry, trying to get my microphone. And do we have a seconder for the amendment? Thank you, Councillor Smith. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, first thing I want to say is I, I understand there are strongly held views about greyhound racing in this chamber and elsewhere, and this amendment does not seek in any way to to uh, stop that debate from happening. Uh, what this amendment seeks to do is to take out of the motion um, essentially items which are nothing to do with this council. Um, so it still allows the council to express a view on greyhound racing, but it takes out of it unnecessary elements um, like asking officers to go and consult local people on something that we have literally no ability to actually carry out. Um, it's really important, uh, in fact, it was mentioned in the in, in when this motion was proposed to understand quite what happened with this stadium. Galliard Homes bought the stadium as they did a number of other stadiums up and down the country in order to run them down um, and, and then be able to develop housing on them. This council fought long and hard to maintain that stadium for local leisure use, and we won that battle and enabled that stadium to come back into use. Uh, we have now successfully seen Speedway return to that uh, stadium, and I've been delighted to attend Speedway there. And Greyhound Racing is also due to return in August. We have no ability in any decision that we might take here today to change that, we don't have the ability to decide for the owners and the, and the people managing the stadium what leisure use that happens on that stadium. We can express a view on it, and I'm not trying to stop you from doing that, but I am trying to persuade you that it is not a sensible idea to be wasting officer time and the public's time trying to imply to them something which we cannot deliver on, which is that we can somehow consult, somehow make velodromes happen, uh, but, 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 and stop greyhound racing. It isn't the case. 
I have to say I'm also quite concerned about the level of debate around this um, in terms of the uh, references to things like, you know, we, we ha can't have gambling and we can't have alcohol near, uh, near Blackbird Lees. And greyhound racing, which is a working class sport along with Speedway, you know, that's, that, that's not allowed. But we can have spectator sports like velodromes. That's fine. So I, I do really am quite concerned about the class-based issue that we have here. Um, so I urge you to support the uh, amendment, which I think makes this a better motion and still allows everyone to express their views about great hand racing. It's Thank you. It's not about class. Thank you. I have a second. Uh, Councillor Smith, do you want to use your right now? Thank you, yes. Um, I'm seconding this amendment, which removes actions from the original motion which are unhelpful and misleading about the scope of this council. There is zero point to this council publicly opposing the return of Greyhound racing at the stadium or consulting on alternative uses. Greyhound racing is covered within the D2 planning use class uh, given to the stadium for assembly and leisure purposes. And the racing is licensed by a national body, not this council. It's up to the residents of Oxford to decide whether or not they wish to attend the races. It's not up um, to this council to decide for them. And in that same spirit, uh, councillors on this side of the chamber will be voting in line with their own personal feelings um, about this subject this evening. The action which will remain in the amended motion, if the amendment is passed, is a call for stronger animal welfare laws covering the sport of greyhound racing, something which I hope will have universal support in this chamber wherever we stand on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have a sp someone's, uh, have someone had a light on there? Okay, who has the light on? Who wants to uh, speak against? Please. Supposing for a moment that we accept, for the sake of argument, the point about uh, actions that are now difficult to achieve. This would essentially indicate that the opportunity for some of these things was in the past. Suppose we accept that. The point that it makes no sense to strike from the requested actions is the one which simply says, stake out a public position that Oxford City Council is institutionally opposed to the sport taking place in Oxford. That would simply be solidarity with people who are campaigning <laughs> with people who are campaigning for animal welfare and taking a side in which uh, it's something that the city frequently does on matters of moral import. That seems like a significant thing to do. Maybe it's the most we can do, but if it is, we should do it. And Councillor Miles. Thank you. Since I prefer, prepared some remarks on the initial motion, I'd like to please state them, if that's okay, because I'm not... Is that allowed? Well, we're discussing the amendment at it the moment. Was, we were not given the opportunity to make a remark after the initial motion was um, said. I've spent an awful lot of time preparing various remarks today, and I just w wondered whether there was still the opportunity for me to make a remark on the initial motion. Let us speak. Yes, we're first debating the sequence of events. Is first we debate the amendment, we vote on that, and then we come back to the amended motion where you can make your statements. Okay, that is the process. That is how it works. So the process is that. So, so any other comments on the amended motion, on the amendment to the motion? Councillor Andrew Mills. I think it's slightly sort of um, um, implausible the way that the, the, the um, councillors are opposite are saying that they're unable to promote a, a, a proposal for a velodrome that they think is uh, uh, kind of somehow unable to be encouraged. I mean, throughout throughout our work, we're encouraging different sorts of development. We can express a preference. I mean, I think it's, 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 it's a nonsense, really, and it's, it doesn't seem genuine. Thank you very much. Sorry. Go on, Councillor Hollingsworth. 
Um, yeah, uh, two, two things. Councillor Miles can speak on the amendment and on the motion, should she so wish and should you allow her. So I'm just telling her that for that, that for her own edification or benefit or whatever. So she could give the same speech twice. On, on the point that's just been, been made, um, the, the issue here is that the, the wording um, says that uh, consultation with Oxford residents on their preferred options for leisure uses at the stadium as part of the local plan consultation. Well, that's not how a local plan works. We cannot take a site owned by a third party and wish it to be something other. Um, that, that's, the, that's the flaw in the issue. We can say we'd like a velodrome. I think we'd all like a velodrome. I'm not quite sure where the funds for such a velodrome would come from. But what you can... Shush, shush. No, they haven't. That's just lies. The, um, <laughs> it is lies. Lord Mayor, this is getting ridiculous. Yeah. Please, can we... Yeah. Um, I, mean, I mean, yes, clearly if British Cycling roll up with vast sums of money for, for, uh, for this, then, then that would be a delight. But I mean, it's clearly not true, never has been true. Um, and if it turns out to be true in the future, then we'll take advantage at that point. Um, my point is that this site is owned by a third party and you can't just designate a leisure use on them. Um, it, it's leisure use, leisure use. Once that's, that's designated in planning terms, they can do what they will with it. A local plan cannot require them for a particular leisure use. It's like going to a cricket club and saying you've got to do rugby or vice versa. You can't, can't do it. That, so it's just, it's just technically incorrect. That was the point. Thank you. I mean, is someone going to speak to the amendment? Uh, Ros Smith, please. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, yes, I'm going to speak to the amendment. I'm very disappointed to see this amendment, in fact. One thing that I'm really disappointed to see is the crossing out, actually, of issuing a press release from this council to say that we oppose the return of Greyhound Racing to Oxford City. Um, I think that's... <laughs> we can, we, and we have, as a council, expressed our opinion on all sorts of things about asylums, uh, welcoming as asylum seekers. We've, we've talked about all sorts of things like that that have a moral right, right to do so as a council. I don't see that it hurts us at all as a council. In fact, I think it strengthens us as a council. Given the number of people that have signed this petition to this council, which has been accepted by the Lord Mayor, I think it is right that we should actually issue a press release saying that we oppose the return of Greyhound Racing to Oxford City. Please, if you keep interrupting, I will have to clear the gallery. So can we... Any other comments on the amendment? If not, can we please proceed to a vote on the amended, on the amendment, not yet the amended motion. Will those in favour of the amendment please indicate? Those again? I count this time. Those in favour? Those against? The majority is in favour of the amendment. So now we proceed to discuss the amended motion <coughs> with the amendment included. Now, you've... Uh, You've heard the argument for the amendment. Uh, would those who, like Councillor Miles, you wanted to speak, would you like to speak to the amended motion, please? Okay, thank you. So, um, thank you for letting me speak on behalf of uh, well, those who I represent and others. And this morning, on considering this motion, I was reflecting on the link between the extreme temperature that we're facing and, uh, and, and the, the motion of no to greyhound racing. And I think the link, which I just want to acknowledge, is around um, this new reality that we live in, so the new reality of climate change, but also the new reality that greyhound racing is, is unacceptable. Times have changed, social norms and attitudes have changed, and greyhound racing is no longer acceptable nor should it have ever been acceptable um, 
Regardless, okay, uh, Oxford, um, the Oxford Stadium could be used for alternative purposes, and I realise that we as a council can't dictate how it is used, um, but um, there is this preference that I think we should acknowledge um, for it to be used for other purposes, and this idea of a veil of dream should really be um, explored further, and we as a council owe that um, to the residents who have put forward this petition and have also um, got a passion towards this. So I recommend and I advocate and support the alternative use um, of the stadium as a velodrome, recognising we can't actually force this to happen, but um, we need to recognise this could provide a public benefit. It could be used as a place for children and adults to learn to ride a bike. Many in our city don't know how to, despite being a cycling city, and it really would play, provide an important place for them to, to learn this. So um, for a city that calls itself a cycling city, but where this is a, simply an aspiration rather than the reality, a velodrome could be a very good alternative um, leisure use for this facility. And so for that reason, um, I would recommend that we um, explore that further as an alternative um, if we pass the motion today. Thank you. Thank you. Other, other comments, please? Councillor Turner and then Councillor... Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. There are obviously a range of views on this, although I was glad to hear at the opening of the debate, Councillor Power, for welcome to the opening of the stadium. Uh, there was a time when there were some councillors uh, who uh, didn't want to see the stadium and reopen and promoted it, actually, in the local plan process as a site for housing. Um, it, it was a great campaign, um, uh, and I bring a statement from the Save Oxford Stadium campaign group, which was the umbrella group, because I thought it was important that they had the opportunity to express their views. And they write, it's absolutely fantastic news that the stadium is returning to its former glory, and by the looks of it, even better than before. As a campaign group, we fought for nine years for such a time, and throughout this campaign, the council has given fantastic backing uh, along with Speedway and Grace, Greyhound Racing fans. It was quite clear all the way through the stadium would return needing both Speedway and Greyhounds. And while we understand that the welfare of Greyhounds is a massive priority, so do the professional uh, Great British Greyhound Board. There are standards put in place to make sure their welfare is in place and already the leaseholders of the stadium have invested in such facilities and more to make sure dogs are cared for uh, during and after their racing career from the stadium campaign group. I thought that, that, those, aren't, that those aren't my words, those are the words of the campaign group. Uh, and I have to say, the reason you know, I'm actually very concerned about animal welfare issues happens I've been a vegetarian uh, most of my childhood or my adult life. Um, uh, uh, I'm also a keen cyclist, as it happens. Um, but I think as a council, having given our support um, for the stadium reopening, having seen uh, the new owners take on quite a significant risk, having seen Speedway return, I think then marking it uh, at this stage with this motion just isn't the right thing to do. I welcome the Speedway back. I also understand a permanent home has been given to the Lees Boxing Club, which is very much welcome. Um, and uh, it just doesn't seem right to me for them to be uh, sort of doing an about turn and uh, uh, disowning it, as it were. So uh, I respect strong views on all sides of the debate, but personally, I won't be in favour of the motion. Councillor Dunn. Thank you. Um, I'd like to speak in favour of the motion on welfare grounds. So greyhound racing poses significant risks to animal welfare. On the Greyhound Board of Great Britain's website, each stadium is required to have a freezer suitable for the storage of a greyhound carcass for when the inevitable fatal injury happens on the tracks. Last year, 359 dogs died in the greyhound racing industry. This breed has a life expectancy of 10 to 14 years, yet retired greyhounds in this industry are from the ages of four to six, where many are put in shelters for rehoming, and the more unlucky ones are shipped over to China into the meat trade. Last year, keeping in mind there were lockdowns where the data does not represent a full year of greyhound racing, there were 91 sudden deaths, 52 died due to natural causes, and 120 greyhounds died on the tracks. These are all young greyhounds in the racing industry, and this doesn't even include the 4,422 greyhounds that were injured from racing last year. Another rule on the website is that greyhounds can be put to sleep if no other option is available to be rehomed or retained as a pet. This includes if vet bills are too high, or if they are unable to find a home if, shel if shelters do not have the room to take them in, and other reasons can be if the dogs are not able to readjust to life outside of racing, 
Bearing in mind most dogs spend their entire racing life in kennels, barely socialising with other dogs or humans, it's, hypocr it's hypocritical that we treat some dogs like family members, sharing tips to keep our dogs cool during the heat wave, while treating greyhounds like disposable objects, or working dogs, as I've heard them called recently, where they are explo exploited for entertainment and can be raced in temperatures over 30 degrees. Note that 19 degrees is the recommended maximum temperature to walk animal companions to avoid heat stroke. Commercial greyhound racing exists in only eight countries, including the UK and Ireland. It is a dying industry, as it is on the decline globally. There are so many other ways to use the stadium for entertainment, such as go-karting, skating, rock climbing, cycling, which all have the key theme of consent and also promote active lifestyles that are cruelty-free. As councillors, we have a duty to represent residents' views and ensure high ethical standards in our city. The return of an outdated, cruel practice that injures so many animals and causes hundreds of deaths is not a high ethical standard. We wouldn't accept this practice done to humans, seconds left. knowing hi the high risk of injury and death. We also wouldn't accept this practice to our animal companions who we love. So ask yourself why you do not extend this compassion to greyhounds and wholeheartedly oppose this awful practice returning to Oxford. Councillor Jafari Mabini. Um, thank you, Councillor Dunn. Just a, a point on gambling, really. Um, it has such a huge number of negative effects on society and on communities, on relationships, on mental health, on physical health. And I really think that having more venues for gambling in our city is certainly not something to be encouraged. And... I speak as someone who is a council in Blackbird Lees, and I'll be honest with you, and I've spoken to my other councillors who are present here today, there is not a huge amount of support from all of our chats to residents over the years for greyhound racing in Blackbird Lees. It is, uh, it is quite, it's quite a varied opinion. There are, there are a small numbers who are very for it, but there are also a huge number who either actually are just worried about making ends meet, as we'll hopefully get to in the child poverty motion, or they are against it, including a lot of young people who feel really, really against this practice. Thank you. Are there other speakers to the amended motion? Please, Councillor Humberson. Yes, Lord Mayor, I originally supported the amended motion, and I withdraw that support. Any other comments, questions? Uh, otherwise, may we go then to the proposer of the... I, uh, sorry, you have your right, please, yes. Councillor Pick. Thanks. Um, so this motion has a simple aim. It's to ensure that greyhound racing doesn't return to Oxford. There's been no greyhound racing at the Oxford Stadium for almost a decade, but we heard last week that greyhound racing will return on the 26th of August. This, this time, right now, is the time to speak out, to stand up for good lives for animals, to stand against needless cruelty. The cruelty and danger that racing greyhounds endure is shocking. Paul has already said these stats, but uh, in 2020, 411 dogs died within the sport, even though there was a significantly reduced number of races due to COVID-19 restrictions. And yes, technically, the sport is regulated, but industry sanctions for cruelty are widely condemned as ineffective, including by the House of Commons Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee. Why would we want to welcome this back to Oxford? And why would we want to give valuable community space in our city over to it? The majority of people in Oxfordshire do not want to see it return, as recent research by Savannah Comrades has shown. I also want to say that I find Councillor Brown's claim that this is an argument based on class quite insulting, as though her par party has a monopoly on representing working class people. I also question the logic that greyhound racing should continue on the basis that this is part of Oxford's history. History can be remembered without being repeated. It's a time we took a firm stance against greyhound racing and explore explored alternative uses for the Oxford Stadium. However, we have the power to do that exploration. Personally, yes, I think an exciting proposal is for a velodrome and cycling facility at the site, an idea that British Cycling have informally backed. That could include BMX and learn to ride facilities, along with plenty of space for other community uses. Residents in the area have been campaigning for this for some time. However, 
Basically, any other use of the site would be better than greyhound racing. You could put social housing on it. You could put other sports facilities in it. Basically, anything but greyhound racing would be much better use of that space. So I'm just going to sum up by saying, maiming and killing animals for sport is cruel and unnecessary. Animals are dying for our fun and to fuel an uncaring and cruel industry that doesn't care about the dogs that are involved in it and doesn't care about the people who are going to watch greyhound racing and spending their money gambling and sometimes having severe um, negative consequences of that gambling. I hope the council will vote with their conscience and support this motion from the Lib Dems. Um, can I... I... May I now invite you, Councillor Falweather, as proposer to sum up. Well, thank you for all the people who've made very positive um, comments about uh, stopping the return of greyhound racing to Oxford. I'd just like to go through a couple of the points raised by the councillors opposite. I strongly refute this is a class-based issue. It's not a class-based issue. There are many people of all classes who have been damaged by gambling. There are many people of all classes who support um, well, dog welfare and, would, and oppose greyhound racing. I don't want, or have ever wanted, to close the stadium. I want it to be used for many other activities, not just on Friday and Saturday evenings, but throughout the week. This could bring much needed jobs and training opportunities to one of the more disadvantaged areas of our city. It could be used by a large number of children and adults of all ages than the much smaller numbers who attend dog racing. By allowing dog racing to return, are we part of a long-term plan by Risk Capital Partners slash Galliard Homes to prove dog racing a failure and then push to redevelop the site as housing, a move which the planning officers would undoubtedly find it difficult to contest? I'm regretting that the amended motion tactically says this council actually welcomes the return of greyhound racing. So in conclusion, I urge councillors to make it clear that this council will not endorse a cruel sport with its harm to both dogs and people. Thank you. May we now proceed to the vote. Will all those in favour of the motion as amended, which is in our uh, briefing note papers on pages 57, 58, if you want to remind yourself of the amended motion. Will all those in favour please indicate? You counting? If you don't know what we're voting for, you shouldn't be voting. It's not about asking the person next to you. The amended motion. I think it is clearly carried. So I think we accept those who uh, vote against, please indicate. Oh, sorry. You're just resting. Okay, and the sorry, the amended motion is carried. Thank you very much. Let's proceed now to the next motion on the provision of period products, where I understand that the proposed amendment has been accepted. 
and therefore we are now going to discuss the amended motion which is as written in page 60 of the uh, uh, briefing note. Um, I'm going to invite Councillor Roll to uh, propose the motion, having accepted the amendment. Thank you so much, Lord Mayor. Um, before I start, I just wanted to quickly say a thanks to the support we've seen from members of the public, um, civil society, and indeed from the media in bringing this motion forward today. Period poverty affects millions of people across the country, including thousands here in Oxford. In fact, recent research has shown that Oxford comes second among the top 10 cities where women and girls are struggling to afford period products, and where 40% admit to struggling some months. Lack of access to period products can have a huge impact on the lives of women, girls, non-binary people, and trans men who menstruate. It can lead to people wearing period products for too long and using unsuitable and unsafe alternatives. And this is not just unsafe, but it's degrading and it's dehumanizing and it stops people from living their lives fully. What this motion does is it takes a small step towards tackling that issue. It seeks to make period products free and available in all public toilets across the city, including in the town hall and in community centers. And crucially, it builds on the amazing work of civil society initiatives such as WINGS, run by the Young Women's Music Project, who I'm grateful join us here in the chamber today. <laughs> This incredible volunteer-powered organisation is already delivering free period products across our city on a monthly basis, a vital, vital service for so many who may otherwise have to go without. But the council must take some responsibility here. Period poverty is a failing of our society and no one should have to go without. Access to free period products ought to be a basic right. They're an essential item for decent living and not at all a luxury. And this is not only an issue of poverty, but it's an issue of dig dignity too. Many people here in this room will have experienced the discomfort of getting caught without and wondering just how you're going to make do. What this motion would do is help end the scourge of that indignity by making these readily available in public toilets. Now, passing this, of course, will not end period poverty overnight, nor in a number of months. There's no denying that this issue is deeply, deeply complex and well hidden. However, I would urge all members to take this important step today in making sure the council is doing everything it can to liberate women and others who menstruate and to take a stand against the shame and suffering that is caused by period poverty. Please vote for this motion and let's help make period products free and available to all. Thank you very much. Councillor Pegg, you are indicated as seconding this. Is that correct? Do you want to speak now? Yeah, sorry, I'm seconding everything today. But um, I'm so pleased to be seconding this motion, um, and yet I'm absolutely horrified it is necessary. Anyone who's had a period will know that the idea of having to deal with it without all of the equipment and paraphernalia required is absolutely unthinkable. This motion aims to be a small part of dealing with that problem by working with local charities to provide free period products in Oxford, as well as putting pressure on the county council and the national government to do the same. But why is this such a problem in the first place? Well, as well as it being part of um, a wider problem with levels of inequality and cost of living, it's also a problem of stigma around menstruation. The too long periods have been seen as dirty and disgusting, something we shouldn't talk about, just something we should quietly disappear to the loo to deal with with a tampon hidden in our pocket. It's absolutely absurd that that is still the case in 2022. But I don't think any of us should be spared the gory details of what happens when you're in period poverty. Using period products longer than they should be used for um, is common amongst people in that situation, risking infections and toxic so shock syndrome, which can be fatal. People have to use rags, tissues, even sometimes newspaper, instead of proper period products. Some people don't have the facilities to keep themselves clean during their period, again, risking infections. And there are people who aren't even able to leave the house because they don't have period products and so can't go to school or work. Last year, I got to go to the launch of the um, Young Women Music Project's Wings Initiative, which provides period products um, and also incontinence products and nappies um, to those who can't afford them in Oxford. I was really struck by the care of the volunteers running this project and the lengths that they go to to make sure people feel comfortable accessing their service. For example, they drop off products in safe spaces at an agreed time so that the volunteer deliverer doesn't know who the recipient is. Um, Something that we've been asked lots around this motion is about whether um, we will encourage sustainable options to be provided. And we absolutely do want to do that. 
I hope that any scheme the council is part of offers menstrual cups, reusable pads, organic disposable options um, to the people, um, because they are actually far cheaper in the long term, as well as reducing waste. However, um, I do think we need to be careful about how we do this. Uh, I used to volunteer for the Women's Environmental Network, delivering workshops about sustainable period products. What I took away from that really was the importance of choice, even if that choice is picking a standard tampax that has to go to landfill. I think everyone should have the option to try a menstrual cup, but it's also completely fine for them to say no, whether that's due to cultural beliefs, inability to reliably sterilize things, or whether you just think it seems a bit weird. 30 seconds remaining. This is such an important motion that proposes a practical and achievable solution to the problem of period poverty in our city. I hope we can come together today and pass it. Um, I would point out that in terms of the time meant to be allowed for members' motions, we have 13 minutes left. Now, I want to know if there are no objectors to this motion, maybe we can proceed quickly to a vote since I think it's been approved as amended. I can see Councillor Aziz wants to say something, but I would like us at least to get on to two more of the motions, if we can. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll be brief. So, first of all, thank you to my colleagues for proposing this very important motion, and thank you also for accepting the amendment. So, as already discussed, uh, data shows that uh, uh, period poverty is growing. Shamefully, our city ranks as a second in a, in a recent survey in relation to women and people experiencing per period poverty. A city as rich as this, I think that's very, very damning. And uh, after Oxford comes Birmingham and then Cambridge. So that gives us some context. The cost of living crisis is further increasing the challenges that people are facing. I'm very proud of the work of this council. Over the past few, few weeks, we've been organizing uh, drop-in sessions in Rose Hill, Barton, Blackbird Lees, and others are more likely to follow as the cost of living crisis deepens to ensure that people across our city have access to help and specialist help that they need. And amongst the survey that was recently put together, 40% of women and girls here in our city said that they're in period poverty. Um, I want to also go on record to thank Zara and Kida, who are here, uh, for their fantastic work. These are brilliant people running the Women's Music Project, and they've told me that they have seen an increase in people coming forward asking for help. We're talking about schoolgirls, we're talking about people with disabilities, we're also talking about trans women, trans men, and trans people. And I think it's testimony to their brilliant work and the way that they work, as the council has already outlined, that people feel safe to be able to come to them and ask for help. So I think we should give them another round of applause. <laughs> And I just want to wrap up by saying that I feel really proud of the way that this work has been done in an inclusive manner, uh, which goes uh, definitely against a lot of hysteria that we're seeing in the mainstream press and tragically amongst members of our shameful government. Um, so I would like us to continue working in this way and use this spirit, uh, the spirit that these fantastic people here are, uh, you know, invoking in their day-to-day -day work. So thank you very much. Thank you. I do not see anyone wanting to speak against the motion. Can I... Sorry, do you want to speak against? Four. I mean, if we want to get on to other motions, I would suggest that it might... Am I allowed to speak? Thank you. Too, but like it might be at the... being silenced once again. Um, so I'd just like to support this motion and thank you very much to our Green colleagues for um, the work that they've done on this and say thank you. Um, and I really would like to call on us um, to, to really explore these sustainable options um, because these are going to be the most cost-effective way um, for um, people to um, be managing um, their, their period. So you know, please, can we um, explore the use of uh, sustainable reusable period products as part of this? I'd also like to acknowledge um, the importance important um, work that needs to be done to address um, the stigma around periods and acknowledge some work that's been done um, in India specifically by an organisation called Menstrupedia um, that has produced comic books um, which are for both boys and girls and are used by schools and available in a diverse range of languages that addresses the taboos around speaking on this topic and so I think as a council as we work to 
end period poverty and um, as we're supporting the motion today that we also look at combating some of the taboos related to periods so thank you very much um, for putting forward this motion which we'll be supporting thank you thank you are we now ready to proceed to a vote on this motion would those please all in favor indicate those against abstaining so it's clearly unanimously carried well done thank you very much well i'm just going to point out we have eight minutes apparently left of our 60 i'm going to ask can we uh, if we have to suspend standing orders sufficient at least to complete the discussion of the bbc oxford cuts motion is that acceptable are those in favor please indicate thank you okay let's uh, uh councillor brown you are proposing I'm, I'm actually going to ask councillor nigel chapman to propose it and i'll second okay councillor chapman thank you very much lord mayor i'm pleased to propose this motion i must declare an interest for many years i worked for the bbc and from 1996 to 99 was the controller for the English regions responsible for regional television and local radio, including services in Oxford. Normally, I take a vow of silence on the actions of my successors, but this proposal is so damaging to local journalism and so ill thought out, I'm happy to break that vow tonight. Firstly, it runs counter to the BBC's charter obligations in relation to delivering strong and impartial news programmes. That charter talks about offering daily, accurate and impartial news to build people's understanding of all parts of the United Kingdom and of the wider world. It talks about offering a range and depth of analysis not widely available from other United Kingdom news providers so that all audiences can engage fully with major local, regional, national, etc. global issues and most of all participate in the democratic process. By reducing the coverage of Oxford and Oxfordshire issues, the BBC makes its coverage less distinctive, more like other providers, offers less engagement in local issues, and will reduce participation in the democratic process because people will be less well informed. They will not, for instance, be informed about some of the debates we've had tonight on greyhound racing and other issues. How that proposal from the BBC fulfills its charter obligations beggars belief and would escape most reasonable people. Secondly, by cutting bespoke television news services for Oxford and creating what is only an editorial muddle of a single news programme covering Hampshire, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and other areas, the BBC will lose viewers and then justify their decision by pointing to declining audiences, a sort of post hoc rationalisation of which they are rather good. Thirdly, the viewers who are missing out will be the digitally disadvantaged who do not have the skills and money to go online and are ironically some of the biggest defenders of the BBC. Accessing broadband services easily is not cheap as we all know. These are the very people who feel left behind by commercial news services, who have withdrawn from the areas because of lack of advertising revenue. They will see this move as yet another example of where powerful organisations are letting them down. The BBC says other services like its online news websites and local radio will be enhanced, but audiences for these are dwarfed by the 6.30 and the 10.30 Oxford Today news programmes on BBC One. Local radio's reach is less than half of that of nightly news programmes of a regional nature, 6.30 and 10.30. 30 seconds Instead, remaining. these loyal Oxford TV viewers can look forward to lots more coverage of life in Portsmouth, Southampton, Winchester, Aylesbury and Buckingham, instead of the local stories they want to see and have grown used to, a less relevant and informative service all round. This is a proposal with more flaws than even Nadine <laughs> Doris's plans to privatise Channel 4. I urge this council to support this motion unanimously and send a clear signal to the BBC it needs to reconsider and reconsider it fast. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Brown. Yes, thank you. Um, councils across the country are putting forward uh, motions in support of local news services which are being cut by the BBC uh, and I can tell you from experience um, and, and you know over 20 years experience working in communications we can see what happens because Meridian went there first and they their coverage of any individual local area is severely compromised um, and I, I know as well because I worked there for many years in Reading 
um, who don't have the same kind of studio that we have in Oxford and who's all of whose news coverage comes from Southampton. If it doesn't have a boat in it, they're not interested in Southampton. And that is basically what we have to look forward to. Lots and lots of stories about boats on the, uh, on the south coast. Uh, on a more serious level, this is serious. It is about excluding people, as uh, Nigel quite rightly said, who are already excluded um, in, in many different ways. And this is a really vital service that um, people will be missing out on. And actually, it's important for us too. This is about holding us accountable. Um, uh, and we're already seeing, uh, frankly, a fall off uh, in local journalism uh, at, in, in newspaper form and radio form too. We need to make sure that the BBC are keeping to their charter. So I urge people to support this, and I hope we can send a unanimous message to the BBC that we support this motion. Councillor Landel Mills. Um, anyone with a democratic bone in their body will be dismayed by the threat and closure of the BBC TV service in Oxford. What this means is they'll be, if not no longer meaningful regular reporting on Oxfordshire and the city life on TV, a lot less. Seen in the context of reduction of reliable, trustworthy local media, this cut will have an adverse impact on our local democracy, democratic institutions, and people's ability to make informed decisions. When Nadine Doris chose to restrict the BBC licence fee to £159, cuts in service became almost inevitable. We're now seeing Nadine Doris's decision becoming a reality. With the rate of inflation now at not over 9% and likely to go higher, the freeze on licence fees equates to a significant cut. And unless this decision is overturned, there will be worse to come. We support this motion and would like to use this opportunity to call on, I will, call on the government to increase the licence fee and improve funding for the BBC and reverse these foolish cuts. There are several hands, but I know we're running into the deadline. I'm going to take Councillor Thomas next. Yeah, just very briefly, I, I also have an interest in that my parents live in Hampshire and it would allow me to catch up with what's going on in their neck of the woods. <laughs> but despite that, as somebody who has both lived and worked in Southampton and Oxford, that I can, uh, I can emphasise that the concerns are incredibly different and I wholeheartedly support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Smoten. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, and most importantly, I, I must rebut uh, Councillor Brown's uh, uh, anti-boat stance. Uh, as an avid kayaker, there are few vehicles more interesting. More seriously, I would like to... <laughs> More seriously, I would like to thank, thank Councillor Chapman for this timely motion. Uh, local journalism is one of those things which is extremely important and which we don't notice it until it's gone. So this is exactly the right time to be uh, leaning on the BBC to reverse a foolish cut. Uh, I just wanted to note one thing in the motion is uh, it's asking uh, for uh, M Lib Dem MP Leila Moran's support. And I'm happy to report to the council uh, that we already have her on the public record on the issue. Uh, she writes, uh, I won't bury you with the full press release, uh, she writes in part, quote, the Oxford-based team is full of talented journalists, crew and creatives from our area, and I am deeply disappointed that this decision means we may see less of the excellent content that they produce on our TV screens. I'll be working hard to ensure there are no job losses as a result of these changes and fighting to retain as much of this key team in Oxfordshire as possible to ensure that the opportunity to work in this industry is protected for the next generation. I'll be supporting this motion, and I'm very glad to have our MP behind us too. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jafari Mabini. Um, thank you very much for this motion. Um, as some of you know, over the last three years before this council, I was the migrant champion for the council, and it has been really great working with BBC Oxford on numerous different projects and actually getting the voices of those who don't normally you don't normally hear on the BBC. We've had, I, I can name lots of different community groups, Syrian Sisters, Afri UK, Syrox. There's lots of different community groups that have been on the BBC who wouldn't normally get that chance. And I really think that that also allowing, in, as we know, the issues are really, really pertinent to our times. And in fact, we know that racialized communities are actually you know, 49% of children of those communities live in poverty. So it's really, really crucial that the issues that are pertinent to their lives uh, get attention. And that has allowed the BBC Oxford has really allowed that to happen. Um, but and we saw that during the pandemic as well. But unfortunately, this would be a really regressive step in that direction, against that direction. So I would urge you to support this motion. Thank you. 
Um, we are at time. Are there any urgent extra contributions before we take a vote? Councillor Hollings. Well, it's a very small one. Um, I think others have spoken about the importance of local journalism for local democracy, the importance of holding us to account, making us uncomfortable. It's also a critical part of journalism, full stop. Um, earlier this summer, about five weeks ago, a young journalist in, on her fourth day um, working as a reporter for The Sun broke the story which brought down a prime minister. She learnt her trade in student newspapers, but also on BBC, local broadcast in Edinburgh, and on local newspapers in Yorkshire. That infrastructure, that learning of the trade is absolutely critical, and we will be a lesser society for the loss of journalists as good as that. May I suggest we now proceed to a vote. Those in favour? Unanimous, so I don't think we need to take it. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, our next meeting, I have no idea when it is. Um, <laughs> but whenever it is, be here, be on time, and maybe keep your interventions brief. Thank you.